<laughs> All right, let's keep it light, not too serious. <laughs> Hit it. It's Friday, January 6, 2023, episode 203. I'm Patrick Ceresna. And I'm Kevin Muir. Trigger warning. This episode, we have no guests, so it's just Patrick and myself. For those who understand that the guests are the best part of the huddle, you might just want to hit skip, and we'll see you next week. But for the rest of you who are interested in an off-the-cuff fun episode where Patrick and myself shoot the shit and talk about markets, stay tuned. We'll start with talking charts with Patrick. And then Kevin is going to try out a new segment, so we'll give his crazy idea a try. And we'll end with an extra long segment of uh, no stupid questions, and uh, we'll uh, settle up uh, the skin in the game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way, so stick around. we got a great show. Lena, hop on. What beer am I drinking this week? So this week, Patrick is drinking Hocus Pocus Orange Sunshine American Blonde Ale with Orange. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, the confession, I drank it last week because uh, uh, when we were supposed to record the last episode. Oh, yeah, and, we, uh, we have some explanation to do. People uh, were saying, yeah, we, we, we apologize. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, it's my fault. Anyway, uh, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, uh, it was out in Brazil. It, but you know what? When I drank it, I was disappointed. It honestly tasted like a orange, like a, uh, like a lager. <laughs> yeah. With uh, with orange tang put into it. Like you oh. just literally put powdered orange tang into a beer and that's what it tasted like. I was disappointed. Like I, cause I've had some great sours that had like, like a, an orange flavor to it and they were just great. Uh, like a, you know, summer drinking beer, but this, no, so not. sorry, Hocus Pocus. It's not, uh, uh, I, I would, uh, anyway, we'll go on with the show and we'll talk about it at the end. Uh, but, uh, why don't you give us some side effects here, Kev? Well, before we do that, actually, oh. I have a plug. Since this show is so unorthodox and non-standard like, uh, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll do some plugs. Um, I thought I'd just throw out that I am going to be a, speaking at a conference. Okay. <laughs> so Which one? For, for those who are interested, those who are out in BC, British Columbia, uh, I am speaking at Mike Campbell's World Outlook Financial Conference. I was just okay. going through Mike, the, Mike I, is a Mike is a good friend of the show. We had, that's I interviewed him back uh, yeah. many months back. Well, and, I was uh, going through the list here of the uh, folks that are speaking, lots of distinguished people, but I think that they just invited me because they needed a bull. Yeah, because it's <laughs> a, it's it's like a bear porn. <laughs> <laughs> the but, uh, no, but, uh, it, it, it's it's funny. It's funny that you corresponds with um, ski season that you're going to BC. Right? <laughs> that, I, no, it, it absolutely nothing, to do, nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. Uh, Mike's a great guy. I, I actually always love being interviewed by him, and uh, he invited me out. And the fact that yes, that was a selling point. He's he's smart enough, or his folks are smart enough to actually put that right in the email. And I was like, oh, you know what? You're absolutely right. It coincides with ski season, so I am there. So it is. Let me just give you the dates here. It is February 2nd, or sorry, February 3rd and 4th. And it's Mike Campbell's Money Talks World Outlook Financial Conference. I also see that our good friend Tony Greer is going to be there. So I look forward to meeting up with him and uh, maybe drinking a, an ale or two with him. And uh, if you're in the BC area, make sure you reach out. Uh, I'd love for it to to kind of chat with you. Maybe we'll have a little bit of a market huddle meetup or something like that. In the meantime, side effects. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics that mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include... Well, I'm just looking here, and I, you know what? I realized we didn't update these, so I'm going to pick some off the, the top of my the black and blank. No, actually, I think those were uh, the ones. Those you are read new last ones. Week. Those are the new yeah. ones. We just, uh... Do you know what it is? Because I thought we had done them. Because Patrick messed up, but so I'll okay. repeat them again. Um, Atlas Discord depression. Uh, penny pumping personality disorder. Uh, <laughs> definitely, lots of people out in Vancouver might have that one. And the Fintwit front load fungus. Oh, that's the worst to get rid of that. Yeah, that is, that is tough to get rid of that one. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's talk some charts, bud. Let's, I'm looking forward to this. All right. So uh, in uh, I can't believe we're jumping straight to talking charts. I, I, have to, I know it's I'm hard. Ready for this. Yeah, yeah. Let's review. Three weeks ago, we were talking about th the top thing, things to watch. It's so old that it's not even worth giving it too much. But we were watching the U.S. dollar, uh, oil, and uh, whether the bear market rally was over. And, well, overall, the market did roll over from uh, where it was three weeks ago. And, uh, and certainly... 
uh, oil prices have been interesting. Actually, we'll talk about the, both of these here in charts right now. But uh, well, let's talk about the top three things to watch for the next one week because – one week from now, we're doing another episode. That's right. We're back on the, every we're, week. We're, we're well, this is a, a unique event since we had to postpone the show one week. So uh, it's thing. But so in the next one week, to, things to watch. Uh, the one thing that I, I'm curious about is whether or not uh, uh, today's little rally in the S and P 500 is the beginning, the beginning of a little bit of a short squeeze. And uh, one of the things, like, look, uh, Kev. I'm bearish. Like, I'm not going to like. No, uh, come on. No, like, I know you're shocked. I know you're <laughs> really? shocked. But I continue to believe we're in a bear market. But one thing, though, that I speculated with uh, my big picture trading members is the idea that it became so consensus that the market rolled over uh, in, in December that uh, I think uh, I kind of asked the question as to what can the market do to screw the most amount of investors as possible uh, as a as a base case. And to me, a quick little short squeeze back to his previous highs would immediately get all the trend chasers uh, rushing to get long, squeeze out all the shorts, and then the market might be ready for a down leg. Uh, and so this kind of a little upturn, it's not actually out of character. I don't think it would actually change my bigger view view of what's going to happen at all. But it'd be really curious whether the market can uh, kind of uh, cherry pick some time above 4,000 for a little bit just to clean out to all the weak hands. What's, uh, what's your thought on that? I don't know. Um, I'm increasingly believing that we're going to have another year of absolutely nothing happening, Patrick. So <sighs> we're going to sit. No, honestly, I know that's a oh terribly boring thing. But that's a, no, it's horrible. It's, it's such a safe call. Oh, I just think, uh, oh, okay, go on, make it, tell your story. Um, well, Patrick, I think that the stock market, uh, we've had many years for the last three or four where we've had large ranges, and I suspect that it's going to be a year where it ends up being a lot quieter. And if I had to make my guess about where we're going to end up, it's going to be here or just slightly down. So although I'm uh, sympathetic to your idea that we're in a bear market, uh, it, it, a better explanation might not be a bear market it might be a sideways market and that's increasingly where what i'm embracing in terms of my beliefs what the stock market will be doing so so my variant to that is uh just put a washout in the middle of it like i could totally see the market being at 3900 at the start of next year uh but i think we could wash out to 3000 in the middle of the year and then make a rebound back and so you'll partially be right but i the idea that it's going to be a much more narrow market i'm a complete seller on uh, I think the volatility will be huge, and I think we could easily have 20%, 30% swings in the market, both down and up uh, oh. throughout the year. I, I wish we could do a one-year bet because I would sell you I a, just, I would listen. sell you one-year variant swap with both hands. Oh, let's – okay. All right. Bam. Listen, <laughs> we have a, a – this is a, a off-the-cuff episode. Next week, we're already doing another one. So why don't we uh, – do a one year bet right now on okay. for, for this thing, and then we'll do a normal bet next week. Okay, so okay, here's my one year bet then. No, 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 we'll we'll do no, it no. when we get to the episode. Okay, we'll do it. What you mean well, when we get when, to that when segment? When we get to skin in the game, we'll okay. we'll make the bet on this. Okay. Okay, sounds so, good. All right. So number two, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about these oil markets. And while, you know, our, one of our good friends, Cuppy, is, uh, uh, you know, l still tilting uh, uh, bullish oil quite a bit. Um, the, when I look at the price action, the bull side of the story has yet to manifest in any of the charts. Every rally is one of the lower highs and lower lows. Uh, every quick rally is immediately met with selling. We have not yet seen technically on the charts a transition moment where the downtrend that's been in place since June of last year has suddenly neutralized or started to turn bullish. Uh, now, it could happen. We could double bottom off of a retest of 70 and then find ourselves at 86 bucks and the charts turning up you know by february but there's no sign of it yet um and uh you know if uh, with the pattern the way that oil is turned here uh it does have a a, a targeted measured move down towards 65 dollars i don't i'm not saying that that's where i think oil's going but uh there's nothing bullish to say about this chart yeah, I don't disagree with you. It, it, it'd be difficult to look at this chart and say, oh, you know, I'm a raving bull apart from the fundamentals. 
And then the question is, at what point do the fundamentals start to get reflected? And uh, will you be able to get in on, in time uh, once it starts behaving better? I, I don't know. Oh, I, I'm I think more... you can get in in time because like it, when it it's, starts it's... going, you could, you could have a 50% rise in oil prices. I know, the but bottom it's, line it's, is... it's psychologically difficult to buy. Like all of a sudden you get two days, we're out of nowhere, thing rallies six bucks, and then you're like, oh, I missed it. And then it no, just keeps okay, going. See, yeah, this is just your time frame because like I said, if, if oil uh, puts in a bottom uh, and it rises, you know, 50%, let's say we're going 110 bucks or even higher, like 120. If, if you miss the move from uh, 70 up to 85, you still have $20 of oil on the upside. Um, you know, I love that Stanley Druckenmiller saying of I, he'd rather get in at the second inning and go all in knowing that the actual game has started than, than to be c- trying to play the game of predicting that, uh, that the first inning is, is already underway. Uh, it's sometimes better to be slightly late and uh, rather than burning theta or whatever, tr- getting chopped around, trying to be early. Uh, and I, I'm sort of in the camp. Like I, I love the bull story on oil. I'm not going to try to push back on it, but there is technically no reason to be long oil here. I don't disagree. I had the good fortune, Patrick, of somebody mailing me a copy of Mister of the Commodity Corpse, which is uh, this famous uh, hedge fund from the, I guess, the seventies, maybe even the sixties, seventies, and lots of folks are are from there. I can't remember the list of. It seemed like half the market wizards were from there. Uh, anyways, they mailed me this book. And the book is called Amos Hostetter, A Successful uh, Speculator's Approach to Commodities Trading. And it's Commodities Corp, uh, September 1977. And in it, at the beginning, they talked about Mr. Hostetter's trading philosophy. And I thought it was a pic- uh, particularly appropriate right now, Patrick, because number one is try to acquire every bit of fundamental information available. Read extensively. Number two, simultaneously post daily charts on commodities and develop a feel for trends. And then number three, this is where it kicks in for you and I on this oil trade. Follow the fundamentals in your trading, but only if and as long as the charts do not cast a negative vote. So that's why you need Patrick, because Patrick's telling you that the uh, oil is the chart is casting a negative vote. It is right now casting that, but I do think that there's a big oil trade. 2023, we're, there's going to be some good money made in oil. Uh, and the, the key is to try to identify when the move has actually when that trend move has actually begun. It's going to be one that's, of the- that's why you got to tune in here, same bat channel, same bat place, same bat time Absolutely. to find out when Patrick tells us the move has started. There you go. And number one, uh, we have the inflation numbers coming out next week. And uh, with the stock markets kind of, well, I mean, today was a nice update, but l- let's be realistic. The last two, three weeks has been a dead zone trade range, obviously pinned by some uh, options gamma and other things you talked about quite a bit. And uh, But uh, the question here is, uh, do you think the inflation number could be a market mover? Do you think uh, finally that kind of gives the spark for a market to m- have some volatility? Uh, I do want to go back to the, the, you mentioned how boring it was and how it got pinned. So I, let's talk about that after this inflation. Uh, I don't think inflation's quite as important as it used to be because the reaction function to the, yeah. uh, to the inflation is not as high as it used to be. So although I do think it's still probably the most important thing to watch, uh, and, and, and I would say it's more important even than today's employment number, uh, I don't think that it's going to be it's going to elicit the same sort of responses that it did three, you know, six months ago. And not only yeah. that, I think that the, the the chances are, if I if I had to guess, were the surprises, at least for the last little bit have been on the negative on inflation. And if those continue, then that's going to probably continue to give some wind in the sail of the to the backs of uh, first stock market. Well, you know what? Uh, the one thing that I, I think uh, drove inflation in 2022 was uh, the strong commodity markets that happened in mid-year. And, uh, and the fact that we have now seen commodity prices kind of really settle in, that rate of change, that year-over-year change of inflation is going to start to cool. I don't necessarily think we have to have a huge mean reversion of it, but I don't think we're imminently going to see inflation uh, you know, printing new record highs uh, in, on the levels. And so you're right. 
I agree with you. Huh. There's no way it's going to work then. No. All no right. Way. <laughs> so let's go back to the pin because I thought that well, that let's, was. Let's pull up the chart. Okay. Because I thought so it was interesting. We're... For those who don't know, that there's this uh, option whale, which is this big JP Morgan trade that everyone's aware of, where the client goes and buys a put spread, which is in essence buying a put, and he funds it by selling a call. And this trade is huge, like just so big. The Billions. first time, I, the first time I tried to figure it out, I was off by a million, and I thought, oh, there's when I was doing P and L or something like that, and I and I couldn't understand. And then I realized it was rounding error. It's just it is just the biggest trade, and I have to say, to be the 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 person the 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 sell side uh, market maker on the other side of that thing, and I know that there's multiples, but there seems to be one big uh, print, and I'm assuming that's probably if I had to guess, I don't know for sure. That's J.P. Morgan itself that takes the other side of that trade. I, that that trader that's got to be <laughs> like. I got to think that every print goes up and Jamie Dimon's on the line wondering how you're doing. <laughs> like, there's got to be a lot of pressure. Uh, anyways, I think that uh, hats off to whoever that fellow is. If anyway, if, if that fellow is by some fluke ever listens or someone can put me in touch with him, I want to buy that man a beer or a woman. Could be a woman. Um, could be an alien. It probably is because that trade is so big and so scary. It feels to me that 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 only an alien would be able to trade it. Anyways, the long short of it is that often when a time st- comes time. To to roll that option uh that the client has sold the call option is either in the money or out of the money and whether it's in or out of the money affects how much delta there is to trade it once the rule occurs when the rule always occurs at the end of the month and, it's, and there's 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 uh it's generally quarterly and there's increasingly once every month but the big one is a quarterly on the september or sorry the the march june september december rules anyways long and short of it is this was a very unusual situation because as we approach roll time that option that the client had sold meaning the dealers were long uh was right at the money and yeah. the fact that it was at the money meant that uh, it was every time it went rallied above it, the market makers were there to sell extra. Now, I, I understand it's not quite this simple. The, the option market makers are dealing with a big book. They have lots of different things. But at the end of the day, the client has sold 42,000 contracts of the strike of 3835. And some of those dealers are long. And on the whole, as it rallies, they have to sell. And as it goes below that, they have to buy. And if we go look at the last week of trading and you account for the fact that, so if you're looking at the future, you need to take in the the $21 of fair value that the future trades at. So the strike ends up being roughly 38.56. And you'll see that it just gyrated around up and down over that the whole week. And yep. then an amazing thing, it almost pinned, like it was within five bucks at the close. It, it, it was fascinating to watch. Yeah. Uh, I, I made the call. I didn't even expect it to ever uh, be that obvious. And, and there is a perfect example of why well, you, you need to, under, you need to understand the flows to, to, to understand what's happening. Think in about it. Like if, if the strike was out of the money in any or deep in the money, it would have had less influence. And then at the same time, uh, we had low volumes over the holiday season. It was like a perfect example of, of the theory at work because at a low volume environment and trading right at the money. Uh, and that's uh, that's where you get the that amplification of the influence, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I was figuring it out in the last day or something. It was, it, it, I can't remember how many futures it was every ten S and P points, but it was a monster number. And I was like, this thing's gonna. And everyone was getting all bullish one time, and everyone was getting all bearish one time. And I kept saying every time I, I, I said to the fellows on the desk, I said, "Oh, we're away from the strike. You should don't get too bearish below. Don't get too bullish above." And yeah. and it ended up being one of the few times I was actually right. All right. So what else you want? To, yeah. What, what else you want to talk about? <laughs> well, let's just go through the list. Uh, you know, listen. Uh, we we talked about that oil chart. Char- I'm going to just quickly go back to it. I want, one of the things I am definitely watching is obviously uh, what happens along its previous low. But the one thing though is that the velocity of the selling that happened. Uh, typically, when you have that kind of magnitude of selling. You would see usually within a couple of days, like a reflexive 
uh, snapback rally that is nothing more than just a typical price action that happens from a move that hap- that uh, occurs in such a uh, uh, with such velocity. And the thing is, at least the last two trading days, the fact that we did not see uh, a rally back to seventy six, seventy seven dollars on oil, uh, it, the sellers are still in control. It's uh, and you know what? When with that kind of velocity that happened, I I'm not uh, that confident in trying to predict that it's going to hold a double bottom. Uh, like uh, if you think about um, what oil can do to screw over the most amount of traders, uh, it uh, uh, you know having a uh, turtle head below its uh, seventy dollar line, where it just kind of pokes down to sixty eight, sixty seven dollars, washes out all those stop losses at lower lows, makes everyone panic short into it, and then that's where a more meaningful trading bottom can happen. I I don't uh, I don't think that there's going to be any long term period below seventy. But a quick washout below 70 is feels like it's a real possibility. You just love the turtle head. And it actually, is the formation. It's as, it's as important as the you, prairie dog. You, You're just scared to use it. Because I am scared to use it. And the fact that you use washouts and uh, there was a whole bunch of other innuendo there that was very well done. I must give you credit. <laughs> it's, it, you it might is not a even, term. You, you might not have even to... realize you were doing the innuendo. No. I can't I even say not. it. Yeah, but the point the point is is, is that uh, uh, you know you have to l- accept this as a as a market huddle pattern, right? Like you're just gonna have to uh, at some point embrace it, and you're gonna have to allow it to roll off of your lips without feeling all shame for saying it. <laughs> you anyway, rem- you remind me of that scene in Austin Powers when he's in the toilet and and Tom Arnold or whoever is in beside he says just bite down on your lip and give a heck (laughs) tell tell that turn news boss that's what you ought to do anyways okay this is evolving quickly let's go to the next chart Uh, dollar index Um, and uh, what I wanted to just touch on the dollar obviously was incredibly oversold and we were looking to see whether or not uh, the dollar was going to put together just a uh, a reversion rally like I'm not you know while I still think that if if shit genuinely hit the fan and that's an if like I'm not predicting it but if shit hit the fan we could have the dollar go all the way back to its previous highs but it would take a lot of uh, things breaking in order for that scenario to play out i mean uh, even well let's let's talk bigger picture here it's the start of the year like obviously this is a pretty significant top in the dollar uh and i know that you've always tilted dollar bearish in the last six months and so you know it, things are sort of looking finally like your your kind of uh, dollar bear camp is is got something but and and to be honest i think you actually have a chance that it, you're right um uh, but I mean, I still, in the back of my mind, view the fact that if, for whatever reason, something in this bear market breaks, like because it's it's that thing that you don't know, you don't know that always causes those liquidity events, and and we certainly under the conditions that we're at can't rule out that at some point in 2023 something breaks, and so you, you know, no one can forecast it because we don't know what it is, but but uh, if that happened and something broke then the U.S. dollar, in my opinion, will play the role it's always done, which is it'll be a safe haven currency while shit's hitting the fan. And in that kind of condition, it would have a rally all the way back to its highs and maybe go for a double top retest. But if if you're right about the sideways market and nothing breaks and miraculously the Fed goes through this rate hike cycle and everyone's just uh, bored to hell because the market's just chopping about, then that's a major top in the dollar. Like uh, it, it's going to be one of the bigger things to kind of try to uh, to work through and see uh, uh, throughout the year as to you know which one of those really starts to manifest. Um, I won't comment on my positions. I will say that my favorite currency guru, the whisperer, the Euro whisperer. Okay. He, I got a cryptic email saying he's shorting the Euro again. Okay. Nice. There you go. Nice. We got to get a name for him. uh, We got to actually come up with a name. Look at, look at this chart on the Euro, right? Now I'm not saying that that low isn't an important one, right? It washed out below parity kind of made Everyone realized how bearish it was. Uh, at this moment, 
if in 2023, if the euro went for a full double bottom retest to solidify a bottoming formation that uh, puts in ultimately where uh, the U.S. dollar top and the euro bottoms come in, that could be the 2023 story, right? It doesn't have to V bottom and just be all upside for the euro for the rest of the year. Uh, I think it could be just uh, just the way you think the stock market could be in a muddle. I think that these currencies are very likely to do the same. Uh, you know, I don't think we're going to have a monster US dollar trend like where we're sipping milkshakes and uh <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, like ultimately, um, I, I just think that this uh, move in the U.S. dollar still has room for it to go back and retest the levels where it was. I don't disagree. Even when I look, actually, I pull this chart up. I understand why my contact is uh, shorting it. Yeah, I actually like the yen, but that's that's I always like the yen. Well, yeah. I mean, it was it was a great trade for you from uh, from February all the way through October. It was. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was eating some crow. <laughs> like, no doubt about it. The only good news is I actually I thought that ball was cheap, so they cruised through my puts so quick because they were <laughs> they were. Um, yeah. uh, 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 sorry, the calls like uh, in terms of the the. Um, well, so the, you were hedging for with the Chicago? Currency? No, no, for the Chicago style. I was just trying to think puts on in terms of this way of doing it, but in terms of the the currency. Yeah, you were trading the future, right? Yeah. So the, it cruised through them so quick. So, it, so I, here, I lost here's money the, so here's fast. The, here's the yen chart uh, inverted, so that that's yeah. sort of the, along with the future. Yeah. So I was buying calls, and the good news is it was falling so fast that I got to reset it lower each time. <laughs> so that great, great. <laughs> All right, that but that's uh, a benefit. <laughs> that, that sounds like an amazing benefit. It uh, does. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> my yeah. next my next batch of calls are going to be struck so low. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, uh, you know, like you're you're, uh, you're sounding like you're martingaling it there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't do that. But I, but I guess what I'm saying is the fact. Well, if that, you don't, we got a lot it, of. How do you ever? How do you ever make it back? You have no, to double no, no. down. No, you don't, because you're buying calls. Oh, so you just yeah. But the thing is, at, at some point, you have to make it back what you kill. No, no. But what I'm what I what I'm trying to to argue is that because the volatility it was so fast and so okay. that you I were was, able it to was, grab it, so much it, more distance. Okay, it, yeah, it was it it benefited me because I was long calls and they became worthless so quick that they were you know the the next batch like. <laughs> Right, and it would be being a grind, or if I'd had Delta One, yeah. it would have been much worse. But hey, listen, it was a terrible trade for a long time. I'm not going to deny that uh, it was <laughs> it was bad, and uh, I had gotten it wrong. I and listen, in in terms of 2022, I misjudged how how aggressive the Fed would be. Yeah. I really did. There's no doubt about it. I misjudged that the Fed would be that aggressive, and and I got it wrong, and it ended up costing me on that position, but. Uh, so be it. You 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 t you make your you you take your you make your bet and you take your chances. Okay, there what else go. are we going to talk about? Gold. Uh, so let's let's talk gold. And um, you know, I well, listen. I I'm sort of torn because back in November, uh, you know, with uh, with my big picture trading members, we were uh, taking positions long gold. We were we were uh, uh, we were positioning it. And in the big picture, I remain actually quite a, a big picture bull on gold. The way Cuppy is bullish on oil, I'm kind of bullish on gold. Uh, but on the short term, I have uh, sorry. Now at the, from these levels near 1900, on the kind of intermediate term of the next three to six months. I'm kind of getting a little bit uh, unenthused. Like I, I love I, it. That's awesome. That is the greatest thing I've heard you, all. Like, oh, so you're loaded up. Good for you. <laughs> well, no, uh, and I just I listen. I I understand why you're uh, unenthused. I had a really you know smart uh, subscriber the other day ask me who's lying, the gold market or the bond market. And I said, usually I would completely agree that that you the correlation would say that one of them's lying. 
I think something changed and that we could have a situation where rates go up and gold goes up. And I know that seems crazy, seems dumb, but I, I so, it's so a, I have it's, a I have a different pushback on that. Okay, because okay, listen, I I get it. You know, like uh, all the top macro people uh, that that show that I uh, that cheat on you with, uh, yeah. you know, come on and they they highlight exactly what you're talking about the you know, the correlation of gold to rates and and all of these different things, but. Uh, one of the things that worked way in the past and then has been working all year long is gold trading as a cross currency to the US dollar. It's not a coincidence that that November low in gold corresponded very well with the euro bottom, which happened through October to November. Right, like the way I look at it is, is that gold right now is literally behaving as a cross currency, and uh, and while you can make these arguments, staring at rates, and one of them is lying, and all this different stuff, I actually think that the next dollar move is going to decide the short term fate of gold because I have a a, a long term bullish view on gold. Right, I'm talking about the the trend of the next couple months and not the big picture one, uh, but I I think that that. Um, watching the dollar is more important for gold than it is uh, watching rates. Mike, that's my call. Okay, that's your call. I, I contend that something is uh, fundamentally shifted and that when the Western governments uh, took the U Russian reserves and said, everything you have in dollars is now all of a sudden ours, you're frozen, it's changed central banks' attitudes towards it. And if you're thinking about this as China, thinking one day I might piss off uh, the rest of the Western governments, I can't afford to have as much at the very, like, sorry, I can't afford to have all my reserves in there. At the very least, I have to diversify. I think there's going to be a constant and steady bid on gold from the central banks. And I think that the mistake will be staring at the dollar, staring at interest rates and missing the fact that the, that gold will rise relative to both of those for some time to okay. come because of that bid. Where I will compromise with you yep. is uh, I believe that gold will outperform all of the cross currencies and against the dollar. And yeah, you're so, just such a dollar uh, bull that you have trouble liking gold too much. No, I completely I'm not. Get it. Actually, no, no. I am no longer a dollar bull. I Just because I think that uh, on an intermediate time frame the go that the dollar could go retest 115 on the Dixie doesn't make me a dollar bull anymore. Uh, like I, I'm just talking technically what can happen. Uh, it's like if I was making a call that the Dixie is going to 120, 130, then you could tell me I'm a dollar bull. So don't, don't pigeonhole me anymore. Uh, uh, it, like because in 2022, there's no doubt I was a dollar bull, uh, but uh, but you know, I point is is at some point the dollar will begin a big downtrend, and maybe it's not going to happen as soon as you think. But you know, just the way you were so bearish on bonds, you just happen to be five years early. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a good buddy that that he's a hedge fund manager and his line that he likes to say is i'm never wrong i'm just early sometimes exactly <laughs> and and so like y your bond call was maybe one of them uh one of the greatest calls you've ever made you were just literally many years early uh and it ended up being totally right Took me a uh, long time to get my short on, though. No, no just because it, <laughs> no, it's, just... It's, it's it's just like that quote that you said at the beginning, right? Like you study your fundamentals. You got to understand your thing, but but the, the technicals have to at some point be confirming this to you. Right? I don't disagree. Okay, and 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 so the point is 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 that. I believe that gold's next major rally, the one that we finally clear 2000 and don't look back, uh, and I'm not going to play with those silly numbers, 2500, 2800, 3000, you know how the gold bulls are. But the point is that once we clear 2000 and don't look back, that's going to be in a period where the US dollar has legitimately begun a bear market. And the U.S. dollar for for years will stay in a mean reverting. Uh, well, it's not mean reverting. It's a new trend to the downside. And that period, gold will have its true day in the sun. What do you, uh, here? Do I think in January two thousand twenty three, I'm going to drink the Kevin Muir Kool Aid about central bank buying? Come on, no, no. Uh, gold's going to at uh, gold's going to on the interim be uh, suffering liquidity concern. Okay, where I'll agree with you, Kev is if uh, you're right about your theory that shit doesn't hit the fan and the market stays trained range bound, if we see that no nothing breaks and this, this nasty next leg of a bear market never materializes, 
And that means that the dollar won't have this huge rally all the way back to its highs because I think it's all intermarkets and all correlated. And under that circumstances, you, maybe your gold call might be right. <laughs> okay. You're just I, too, you're too I, bullish. I, I, you're too bullish. I'm do- it, on gold? It, on everything. You're just... No, I'm, you're not, too, I'm not bullish on the stock market. I just think... No, I'm, well, I'm, I mean, well, I, I'm you sorry. Just call, you just call you're, anybody you're that doesn't bu- think it's going to collapse is a ba- bullish. Exactly. This is like, I mean, anyone right now who doesn't recognize into this rate hike cycle and and the fact that we've been going through this uh, this uh, shit storm on there that suddenly we're no, we're not going to go down is you're basically I, th- bullish. I think we are. You're going basically down. bullish. I think we are going down though. I just don't think that's we're not going what down. you said earlier. No, I I think that like it'll most likely end the year flat. But I think that well, okay, it, I, I could agree with that. But like, how low? How low? What do you think the low print will be? No, forget. This is our bet. Like, we're, we're talking. About this in Anyways, the skin let's the go game. on to the, let's go to your next chart. Whatever you want to talk about. Anyway, the point Taylor is, I, I I will I I will not be shocked if in the first quarter of the year, if gold is below seven fifty seventeen fifty for at least a temporary basis on a that will prove to be a buy on day. That's okay. my my that my call. You know what? We're going too long. We have this huge section on uh, on uh, Q and A, so let's leave it at that for charts, uh, and let's go on. Okay, don't forget, we don't have a guest. So yeah, we because we have a new segment, Kev. <laughs> okay. We have a new segment. What the hell is this? Like, I, I have no idea. By the way, for everyone, I don't know what Kevin's up to here. And, no, you uh, kind of know, but you don't really know. So um, I don't really I, know. I have a new toy that I want to play with, and so we got we to gotta have some fun. And so for those who are, are listening and not watching this on YouTube, it says new segment with a question mark. <laughs> Because this is still up in the air. New we're gonna segment? we're gonna keep, keep it. <laughs> okay. So what I thought would be fun is that a lot of times you'll listen to people on on TV or on Bloomberg or on CNBC, even though I don't watch CNBC, and you'll think to my, yourself, "Oh, that's a really interesting comment. I'd love to talk to Patrick about it or whoever your buddy about it and discuss the different elements." So what I've done is I've finally figured out how to hook it up so that I can play and control different uh kind of an input into the uh into the stream you know we're about to have a technical difficulty in about yeah it's about to not work (laughs) you're absolutely right so what we're going to do is we're going to play some things i'm going to be able to control and listen to it we're going to talk about it so uh, so we're going to start with one of my favorite uh, ed yardini and we're going to talk about something that actually i'm sure is going to trigger patrick but let's just go for it anyways (laughs) okay here we go not Ed Yardeni, president of Yardeni Research, joining us right now. Ed, I want to start with a de-inversion of the yield curve. To me, this has been one of the least talked about, most important aspects Correct. of what we've seen. What's your take on why we've seen this sort of unwind in a way that's been very unexpected? Well, historically, the yield curve inverted. Uh, it's widely believed it's inverted because it's uh, predicted recessions quite accurately. Uh, I think there's a step uh, before that that uh, has been widely ignored, and that is an inverted yield curve typically signaled that something was going to break. There's going to be a financial crisis, and that crisis would morph into an economy-wide he's, credit. He's talking your language, Patrick. Couldn't get money, and that's what caused the recession. This time around, we've had some financial crises in the crypto market and uh, in the SPACs and the, a lot of the ARK stocks, uh, and yet we really haven't seen an economy-wide credit crunch. I mean, clearly. Credit is very difficult in the housing market, and it's getting harder to get in the auto market. But it's not the kind of credit crunch we've we've had in the past. And uh, therefore, I think we're probably more likely to get a, a soft landing out of all this. Wait, but Ed, just to sort of put a bow on it, are you saying that this time around, yield curve inversion does not signal recession? I think this time around, it signals falling inflation. Um, it doesn't necessarily... Oh. Oh imply that a recession's coming as you know patrick yes okay okay so did you hear that uh, I, he, yes he was, i did he, he, and I, I i vomited a little bit in my mouth <laughs> like it, it's uh <laughs> i thought it was fascinating this is the first person i've heard that has suggested that that uh signal which is a yield curve inversion might not be as infallible as everyone thinks it is <sighs> is it my turn to talk you go ahead okay you, you're right. allowed to talk on it during it whatever you could make throw up sounds as you're listening okay okay no okay when 
what, okay, just uh, I, I don't need you to call specific dates, but roughly when before the financial crisis was uh, the rate hike cycle occurring? It was 2005, 2006, right? Okay. What's the financial point? crisis happened in 2007, 2008 because it takes years for uh, – not years, but it takes an extended lag period for things to start breaking from the higher rates. The fact is is that the, we went through one of the most aggressive rate hike cycles, but already claiming that because nothing is broken in the middle of the rate hike cycle is, is nonsense. Tell me – if you want to argue a soft landing to me, and in 2024, we can say – it's been a soft landing. 2023, you're already calling a soft landing in the middle of a rate I, hike I'm cycle? Not, I'm Nonsense. Not calling it. Ed, Nonsense. Ed, Ed, Ed's calling it. I just want to talk about it's it. Too it. It's too well, early to call I, it. It's too early to call it. Listen, he, he's got to make a call about the, you know what he sees in the markets. I thought it was just interesting to put out there that the fact is that he doesn't think it's causing it, – that, that people are rushing to bonds not because they see a recession coming but because inflation's falling. And that's his argument. And one of the things that I just also wanted to highlight is that everyone thinks that this yield curve uh, indicator is is some sort of magic, uh, you know, being that uh, uh, it just is is always going to print you money or whatever. And when you look at it, it's actually a U.S. phenomenon. And, and I realize we're talking about the U.S. yield curve uh, inverting, but this throughout the world. There's all sorts of bond markets that invert and don't call. Co- there's no recession caused. Now you might argue it's because the U.S. is the reserve currency and that's the major economy that rules the 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 global kind of system. So therefore, that's the bond market you should be watching. I'm just throwing it out there that it's that there's a better chance than people think that maybe the bond market, the long end of the bond market, isn't as smart as the as everyone thinks it is. I'm just throwing it out there. I, I know you don't like it. I I you don't there? think it I yeah, I don't think it's the long bond uh that uh that is the this this magic thing. I think the fact is is that the short end rate fucking blew so high so quickly that uh, just because the long bonds didn't want to go up remotely as fast as the shorts, uh, uh, short end yield, uh, inverted the curve. I, I, I don't even like the idea of saying the yield curve inversion itself is uh, the recession. Like the bottom line is there's like $90 trillion of U.S. credit stock in the system and ultimately raising interest rates at the rate that it's done is going to have a, a, an influence on the ability for people to refinance, to manage their existing loans, uh, all these different things. And it, 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 in six months into or nine months into a rate hike cycle, it's saying that if because things haven't yet broken from the interest rate hike, it doesn't mean that they're going to break. Ultimately, uh, I'm a seller on this. I think that there... Uh, it's just too early. I don't even want to pr- say that something will break. It, it probably, is, uh, I think it's a, a real possibility something can break, but it's too early, too okay. early to make that call. I don't disagree. Um, it is too early. Yeah. It's something to with think about. Inspirations um, one second, dinners. stay with me here. I'm making a mess. Uh, uh, let me go to our next thing. Let me just go and figure it out here. I got to get to the right spot and you're going to like this one. It is Dan uh ives from wedbush and here we go and he's talking about the tech layoffs patrick where miss mr musk's world unravels look i I don't think we're there yet i mean but i will say that look about 60 to 70 dollars of the sell-off has been Musk twitter driven now now clearly this part is the demand story the price cuts that we're seeing in china but I believe, look, at $100, we're getting to a point that I believe this is starting to get to just a massive risk war to own, despite going into a Q4, where clearly they're going to lower guidance. And I think that's really the fear. Can you help me understand the demand backdrop? So first of all, Patrick, isn't that interesting that uh, Dan Ives says clearly uh, Tesla's going to lower guidance? I thought, I thought that was really interesting. That basically, you know, here's a big bull and he's... And he's telling you that the the Tesla is about to go in lower guidance in in the future, and and I th- I think that's coming, and so that what his argument is is that, that the decline that we're seeing right now is that getting priced in. I uh, 
whether uh, you were outright, uh, you know, um, super bearish Tesla, because I know generally we've on the show always tilted to the bear side of Tesla. It's just in my mind, when Tesla's market capitalization was greater than the entire auto industry combined, uh, or at least American auto industry combined, it, you knew that it was asymmetrically skewed. It's not like uh, Tesla was going to go and double from there. And uh, the idea that it could go and be priced like a normal car company was a much greater risk. And uh, I, I think that uh, this uh, this kind of what bear markets do is uh, is kind of wash out the fools, and uh, and the Tesla bull is is over. Well, uh, and one thing I will say though, Patrick, is a lot of people will talk about this last hundred dollars like somehow the bears won, and I I disagree with the, the those folks that think the bears won on Tesla. Tesla is still f- up off the COVID lows four times. Like let's pull up the chart for us. Like let's go look at what the the yeah, COVID yeah. Here, low was. I'll, I'll quickly uh, I'll quickly pull it up here. So, like I I don't view this as some sort of giant win for the for the uh, for the bears because the reality is that the they're still way on side from uh, just yeah like March. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, like Tesla back in uh, during the the COVID low so two years ago. Was it two? No, three years. Yeah, it was twenty-five bucks. So you're still up four times, which is much better than almost any other tech stock. So I, I'm not. I, I, I refuse it's to just, kind it's of. Just, it's just it's absurd what Tesla did to the upside. Yeah, no. Uh, and, listen, was it crazy on the upside and stupid? No doubt about it. And and for all those people that bought up there, it's really tough. But I don't think that the true Tesla bears can go and and all, actually. All, all has to be said is. Kathy Wood on Tesla. That's all that has well, to be said. Anyways, that, 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 I, I will say that the the Bears won't win until we at least go down to the COVID lows. That's to yeah. me. I think right now the Bulls are still winning, and that I think that there's still more to come, and that this is going to be a longer story. But uh, having <sighs> what do you said mean that, as Bulls are winning, uh, that's a nonsensical comment. Why? Uh, if you I were, don't, if you uh, bought in March of 2020, um, you're no. up four times your money. <sighs> Uh, th- that is not bulls winning. Bulls winning is if you sold at the top. The uh, the fact that you no. you know got wiped out the amount nobody, of nobody did sells. Off the high. No, no, I no, disagree. But the thing is, is that uh, uh, saying that you know uh, the bulls uh, rode it from four hundred down to one hundred, but they're still winning. That's that's a. a, a I, no, I don't like the, I don't like uh, it doesn't sit well with me what you well, said. Well, I, I just I disagree. I, like if you're sitting there and you're telling me that you know I can make an investment that's 100 grand today it's and it's going to be worth and, and, off its highs and you're I like don't care. You're, it's still you're still up four times. It's oh still better. God. Anyways, let's okay. Listen, listen, you know me. I'm I'm not a bull. Right, so is, there, I'm is, just, there, I'm just, is there another one where you can play you, one oh, more? Yeah, we're going to do this for a little bit more. You got to hang tough. We got a lot All of right, fun okay, things let's, to let's do. Let's keep going then. Particularly okay. in China, specifically in China. We're going to talk to Dan Ives. The but the lockdowns, it's this part here coming up that I really thought was interesting, Patrick. off the back of competition. I'm trying to work out what lasts here and what fades. Yeah, I think about 30 to 40 percent of it is what I view as COVID driven in terms of the lockdowns and, and really what we've seen in country. But but no doubt, I mean, it's an arms race that's happening in China from from Neo Xping to, you know, called 20 or 30 other OEMs that are really going after Tesla. But when I look at the EV market in China, we're still in the second, third inning. I just view this as the market going from hyper growth to more moderated growth in just the quickly, face Dan, of a recession. When they reopen, I think a lot of people would make the argument right now that this is a more nationalistic Chinese consumer. When they reopen and they've got the spare cash to spend and buy a vehicle, are they buying Teslas or are they going local? Well, that's been the debate. And ultimately, the brand of Tesla continues to really be unmatched. And I think that's why the, if you look at the Chinese consumer, especially on the higher end, if they're going for EVs, I'd say two of every three. Is so I disagree with this, Patrick. The He's having the lower rates. But anyway, so let's just keep going because there's a part here margins, coming up that's more. And that's why the clock struck midnight for Tesla in terms of hyper growth. And that's what you're seeing reflect in the stock. Although, the as we said, 70% of the sell-off, we believe, has been Musk Twitter-driven. 
All right. Well, and not to get into the whole drama there, but there is this question. If you strip out the 30 percent that isn't related to that, how much Tesla is representative of a bigger story within the tech sphere, in particular that you're seeing with a lack of demand, a saturation after so much buying of certain types of electronics during the pandemic? How much have we already seen a right sizing in some of the tech companies as they do layoffs versus there more to be go more to, more room to actually cut. Well, first of all, tech companies. If you look the last four or five years, I mean, they were spending money like nineteen eighties rock stars. So, at okay, first of all, how good a line is that? Yeah, they, they were doing that. But uh, and, and Patrick, this is actually interesting because we argued about this for a while about whether we could have a collapse in the big fang mats without a collapse in the stock market. That was a yeah. source of our debate for a long, long time. So now that we've had the collapse in the fang mat, do you consider who would you say had won that debate? I don't think the story's over because I'll give you an example. It, um, uh, you know, in, uh, at the start of like, first of all, I'm not trying to predict a 2008, and it's certainly not a financial crisis of the equal magnitude of what happened in 2008. But uh, at the start of 2008, many bank stocks were getting their faces ripped off to the downside in a big way. They were the equivalent of what Fang is today. And yet you had many resource stocks at the start of 2008 making 52-week highs. And there were the, and, uh, the market itself was still uh, at that same kind of divergent thing of where if you were just a, a sector picker, you could end up still having had a good period. But then um, that didn't, that's not how the bear market ended. And all I'm saying is, is that you're right that the Fang stocks did take the blunt of the hit. They're they they're they're doing to the downside <laughs> what the financials did in 2008. But I don't think that the bear market is over, and I don't think you can vote on that yet. I mean, sure, today at the at this stage of the bear market where we're at, that lo- you're right. The, the the Fangs did sell without the whole market crashing. But I just don't think the bear market's over. I don't think I'm right. I think that it was actually in between. The stock market ended up going down more than I thought it was going to go down, but I would say that it didn't crash. I did think it was interesting I, how you, you talked about... But do you not agree about, with me about, that it's about, still too about, early? Yeah, maybe. It could very well be, but I did, did think it was interesting that it wasn't the brunt of the selling, but the blunt. I think you've been hanging out with those stoner dudes oh. of your friends too much there. Okay, yeah. let's keep going with this. <laughs> Peace, if you look at it, that was not sustainable. Clearly now going into a recessionary environment and what I'll call a hangover post-COVID from a growth perspective, you're going to see the cuts. But I look, I view the cuts similar to as I viewed them in 09 and 01, 02. It's ultimately the start of a right sizing that leads to the next up cycle. Is this Silicon Valley adult? Okay, that is such crap. And that th- this is where I think you and I agree, Patrick. He Dan's trying to argue that we're about to cut, you know, whatever, five, ten percent of staff, and that that's going to be the bottom of uh, that makes the the kind of cathartic selling off of these tech stocks that leads the way to the next bull market. And I he, he he mentions he mentions oh one oh two. But in he, in he, what he fails to mention and think about is the fact that stocks, uh, the dot coms, well, you know, let's pull it up here. Pull up your chart of when the NASDAQ peaked. It was what, March of 2000. Yeah, when did right. it bottom? Oh, it was 2003. Yeah. And and well, this is this so is my key. huge. I'm going to put on a weekly chart and then slide over. This is my huge pushback that that everyone is going and they're already trying yeah, like here here's the tech uh, peak which happened in uh march of 2000 and ultimately the the bleed out low was in october 2002 yeah september october and and this is this is my pushback to to everyone that i, I find is they're all still trying to buy the tech uh bottom yeah it, it, it's just going over and over again people are like oh the recession's coming uh, bonds are going to go up and rates are going to go down and guess what they're going to come for they're going to come for the for the the the, uh, the the fangs and and I, that and i i just want to say stop it like i want to be like that michael jordan video where he says uh, you know stop it about drugs like and he says stop it you know yeah. do something else but but it, you know every uh, this is the beauty of the markets is that uh, there's always a new bull market somewhere, but the foolishness is to assume that the bull market will return to the same place where it was the bull market in the previous cycle. 
And You're always a nightmare to. Sorry, I yeah. got. I, 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 I'm still working. You, got, you on were this. premature. I yeah, was. You pre- were premature. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I feel like, uh, I feel like, listen, I feel like a seven. I my, feel like a seventeen year old that important. You just um, needed to cut me off because uh, I had nothing right. good to say. Okay. So let's. Because we're go talking forward. about we're talking about the reality of that. Um, the people are bullish on text and, and are very optimistic. Well, let's do this. Uh, uh, the kind of height of folly. And, and, and I know people are going to laugh about this and laugh about this video and they're going to say, Oh my goodness. That was just the kind of, um, that was just this idiot in particular. There's no way people believe this, but I contend that in February of 2022, um, this is when this was, uh, recorded. This was way more consensus than anyone gives credit for. Let's play it. Yep. Europe, always a nightmare to do business. America's the only game in town. It's just us. You want to put a million dollars to work? You're going to buy a bunch of European companies? Why? Why? When you could buy Why? Apple, you buy Disney, Why? buy Netflix, Why? Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Nvidia, Tesla. 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 <laughs> The king. <laughs> it's the only game in town. Oh, that's so funny. He's so convincing. Yeah, it's and- it's 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 like honestly, yeah, put him, uh, you know, like like if he's uh, he might as well be like Martin Luther King standing at the uh, <laughs> uh, up at there preaching. Like, but uh, but you know, listen, a lot of like people- I wanted to put my hands up in the air and like say hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> But a lot of people honestly believed a lot of that back then. Yeah. That was not that far off consensus. And think back to people's attitudes about Europe. They hated it. There was no way that it would ever do. People would say, yeah, why okay, would but you- Europe still sucked. Okay, he was only half right. No. So let's let's <laughs> go through it. So let's go through his things. So, uh, I, I went and looked at his returns from February 2nd, which is, I guess, when he did this, to uh, December 31st, uh, to the end of the year. Apple down 3%. That's a pretty good pick, actually, for him. Uh, Walt Disney down 54. Netflix down 48. Amazon down 49. Alphabet, uh, Google down 15. Uh, Microsoft, he actually had a winner. I'm proud of him. He was at 0.5%, almost a full percentage point, or you know, almost one beep he made there. NVIDIA down one beep, and then Tesla, the king, down 54% for a whopping average of minus 28%. So if you listen to you okay, know, good, but good from Ross top Gerber, to bottom, oh, sorry, from yeah. top to bottom, the euro stock was down 26% since he said that. So uh, like a point I'm making is no. that he wasn't totally wrong. No, about I think Europe's you're wrong there because from well, February 2nd, from February 2nd, if you yeah. bought like February 2nd, it's actually up in terms of in you, now if you do it in what currency you have to do it in. Well, I'm I'm here looking just at the euro stock, yeah, just the, the, the index. I think you got it wrong. What do you mean? This is February 2nd and uh, you have to do total returns. I did total returns because these they, they can actually oh, pay. You're talking yield. OK, no, I'm yeah. just like looking at price levels purely on technical. Well, so right? I did. I did. I did total returns and the total. OK, return- but but I'm but a point I'm making is, OK, Europe had an extraordinary two months. OK, but at the bottom, it was down 26 percent. It's not like like, I mean, you're talking about if someone bought Europe, uh, you know, uh, over the last couple of months, fine, they're, they're looking great and fine. It's flat on the year uh, from when he made that. But like, it was still a ridiculous bear market in Europe. Well, if you if you'd gone on his picks and hold it until the end of the year, you'd be down 28 percent. If you'd bought European the you're SX5, you're actually up 10 percent. Because you have to put the what? dividends in there. Yeah, now you're 10%. probably doing U.S. dollars. You're probably doing U.S. dollars. No, this is just the index. This is the... Yeah, uh, the so if I go into SX5E and if I go put it in and I put Feb... Unless Bloomberg is telling me something wrong, but let's just put it in here. 02, 02, 2022 to 1230, 2022. Yeah, and I got a mistake here. Absolutely right. You're down 10%. <laughs> Thank you. All right. No, like anyway, uh, but the point, the point though, okay, no, no, but you're, I get your point though. You're, the point is, is that fading Gerber was, uh, was a hundred percent a great fucking trade. Uh, yeah. the, like, especially if you did it as a long short combination, absolutely. Right. Uh, the, you're, um, you're absolutely right. Anyways, the point is that his confidence that this was going to be the greatest trade and that everyone, um, was going to be, uh, 
these stocks were going to crush everybody. It represented consensus. I think it represented yeah. the peak in uh, the relative valuation. And I suspect that when we look back, that that will be the top and that these will continue to melt. And I, all I look at is Dan and Ives and I see everyone trying to buy these stocks. And I think that they're, they're going to they're gonna continue to be sources of, of cash as opposed to um, the kind of the start of a new bull market. All right. Anyway, well, listen, that's my two. I, I, uh, interesting uh, new segment, Kev. Uh, is there one more? Or is that, no, that that's it. Awesome. I got oh, it. Because, uh, like, it, does this new segment have a name? Or no. are we just calling it a new segment? It might be the new be? segment. New segment? With a question mark forever. <laughs> <laughs> News segment. All right, uh, but okay, that's cool. Let's um, let's go on because this is uh, this we is got a lot of questions. Settle it. No, no, no. First, skin oh, in the game. skin in the game. Okay. No, but listen, we just talked about it at the start of the show. We're doing this different. First of all, you got me. But listen, with the XLF, it was it, I. I, you just gave. Uh, I couldn't. I know. I couldn't get behind five points. I had to take. Uh, I had to take the risk. You and you know this. This is why you're doing these bets. You're smart. Like you're you're, you're chipping away at me with these. Uh, with you know you priced it right. Yeah. And I had. Well, to I take, also. I also know. I had to be, you, do a, You're I had also to a up. buyer of all, so you like these things. And I'm a seller usually, so well, that's listen, just the, if you get, Obviously, if you gave me one-to-one odds, there's no way I would have yeah. taken it. I, I couldn't take the risk. No, I, no, I, no, I understand. Take... Anyway, so for those who don't know, it was XLF. It was a one-touch for 30 and three-quarters by December 30th. And I think I, it was four-to-one or five-to-one. And Patrick took it. I so dangled it, and he so, fell for it. So this is the way I propose we do it. Next week, you're making the new bet. Okay. Uh, because you won this week. Fair but enough. But this week, we're doing a New Year's bet. Okay. We're doing a, a bet that will settle one year from now. Right. And I think this is what I proposed because I was thinking about it while you said it. We can look at the realized volatility of the S&P 500 for 2022. Okay. And we bet that the realized volatility for 2023 is higher or lower. You're going to choose higher. I'm going to choose lower. Than last year. Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. I'll take it. Okay. So now uh, I would love another one of your Wagyu uh, steaks with the chimichurri. Because I tried to make the chimichurri sauce. For those who don't know, um, um, we actually, my my teenage son decided to try to make a, a new uh, your household uh, tradition of steaks on Christmas Eve, which is pretty good goddamn tradition in my opinion yeah um, so okay. i was all over it i did very little convincing of that but you, and me- you messed it up though. i messed up and so i was uh, you know texting patrick for the chimichurri sauce that i love so much and i think i put too much onions or whatever i just can't do it i got it so I, i'm I, gonna mail or you uh the chimichurri <laughs> sauce because patrick makes literally it's it might be one of the greatest steaks of my life that i had was, was <laughs> it when Patrick barbecued the Wagyu and then put the chimichurri sauce on it, it was outstanding. So I'm yeah. all for uh, a, re- a repeat of that if you're into it. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, absolutely. And if That's I lose, perfect... I'm not. I'm not going to. Uh, well, I guess we'll just. Whoever... No, 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 no. It's whoever's paying. We're going to have the. We're having it. It's just one person is paying and the other one is. Sounds eating. good. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So it's realized vol. Is going to be less than twenty in twenty twenty three. It's going to be less than twenty. This is one of these bets where I couldn't care less if I win or lose because it sounds so good and <laughs> well, honestly, the greatest steak you ever like I've ever had was Patrick's one with the wagon. Oh, stop okay. teasing! I'm blushing on if, if those people can't see. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's get on to the questions. We got a lot of them. Oh, all right. By the way, the score was twenty nine to twenty two. But no, no. Uh, and uh, for it's a, we'll make the new bet for the biweekly next week. Yeah, we'll all tell right? the rules and stuff like that. All right. So now we have a extra extra long no stupid question segment, and the star of the sh- uh, the the segment oh, 100%. is hundred percent star so of the, fi- uh, the like, show. Lena about the segment. Good. Did you do your stretches, Lena? Get a, a get a, a ready for this uh, long episode. I hope it's good enough. But I'm going to bet that you guys are not going to remember the bet you just made at the end of. The no, year. I will. <laughs> no, no, I will. That's a good way. It's Lena, easy. are you going to write it down? For us? <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I know it. <laughs> There's right. steak on the All line. Right. I definitely wrote it down. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay, so uh, it's uh, no stupid questions, and we have what like must have at least ten of them, right, uh, or more. There's, there's quite see. a few. 
So if we, yeah. can, we can get so, right into it. So, like, uh, Kevin, no long-winded answers. Yeah, I know, to I, be, know. I know. We fair. must be concise. Okay. Uh, no, we, 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 we could go a little more buzzard. than a yes-no answer, but but uh, but uh, let's okay. be... All right, let's do it. Lena, what's up? Season's greetings. Kevin, you might want to plug your ears for this one as it's a question about the dark arts of technical analysis. Nice. Patrick, on the show that you cheat on Kevin with, one of the tools you discuss most frequently is the Fibonacci. I don't hear you mention moving averages as much as your co-host over there. Would it be correct to say that fibs are the cornerstone of your analysis? If so, why? Additionally, what would you say are the worst or more unreliable technical analysis tools or methods besides Elliott Wave Theory? Kevin, if you keep your crayons in your desk drawer and don't subscribe to technical analysis for trading, what are you looking at before entering a trade? Cheers. All right. So uh, there's a, a many questions in here for basically, um, I mean, the way I kind of look at it is uh, in general on a high level basis, technical analysis is just uh, the study of price action and you're looking for uh, way, a, a creating your asymmetric uh, uh, trade propositions through the study of, of the charts. And I happen to uh, find uh, 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 using Fibonacci as a fabulous tool for actually uh, being able to strategically find and, and implement asymmetric trades. And so a uh, great question. Uh, Fibonacci's are a part, important part. But, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong in many ways using moving averages uh, uh, is still a very acceptable way. So uh, the way that I would describe it is, for instance, um, if you do a 50-day moving average, it's the average price of the last 50 trading sessions. And so when you do a Fibonacci and you're looking for a 50% retracement, often, not always, but often, the, the moving averages lie within the FIB zones. And so traders that tend to buy reversions back to moving averages are in some degree or another doing the same type of stuff I do with Fibonacci. It's, it's, there's just so many different ways to trade. Uh, and the key is to specialize in one way that you've got an edge. And, uh, and everyone needs to kind of find their own way of doing that. In terms of uh, Elliott Wave Theory, uh, you know what? I, I just hate the, uh, the idea that there's these mega super cycles and these uh, playing over many decades because the problem with staring at tr uh, charts uh, with that big of a time frame is, is that in many cases these indices are not inflation adjusted. And so you don't, you know, the idea that you can have a monstrous correction in a stock market um, back to a certain price level isn't accounting for, uh, you know, how the underpinning money is uh, is worth when you look in time frames of many many decades and so i i just think that the long term technical uh, uh use of elliot wave has many big question marks on that front anyway kev there's a part of that question for you a good thing we're keeping them tight patrick <laughs> um <laughs> I just calling me out. I love it. It's perfect. And I, you're I, so right. I just I, I had to explain myself. All right. What am I looking at? I just phone Patrick and ask him. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> hey guys, this is the most entertaining financial podcast. Do either I don't believe <laughs> do either of you use market signals like the VIX, VIX futures curve, or three to six month VIX numbers as inputs to gauge market sentiment in anticipation of market direction? My thoughts are that these numbers could give an indication of how people are hedged. And if they're hedged, then they're paying for protection against something. Would love to hear your thoughts if this makes sense. Also, would following indicators outside of price and volume still be considered quote unquote technical analysis? I'm going to leave the last one to Patrick, but I'm going to talk about the VIX. Um, I use it all the time. And one of the main things that I look at is the slope of the VIX curve. And if you look over time, uh, the time at periods when it becomes inverted and the front of the curve is much higher than the farther dated ones. It is often one of the best um, signals out there to get along the stock market. Uh, there's other ways you can use it, but for me, that's my main one I use. Oh, actually, wait, I, I'd like to add one thing. I use it as well on my day trading as a way to estimate the sort of Vanna flows that I'm going to get from... Uh, market makers that are adjusting their book. 
So the observation I just want to make, and maybe you can comment on it, Kev, uh, is is that the VIX dynamically changed when it became a, a tradable vehicle. Uh, before, it used to be a gauge of, of like market fear and option flow uh, when it was simply just measuring uh, what the volatility being priced in the S&P is. But when they created the futures and derivatives on it and, and other traders trading it, it, it made it a player on the field. It made it a part of the market. And so it changed in terms of uh, what its original observations were made. It, it just I'm not trying to say that it's no longer valuable. It's just simply it's no longer the same thing that people were observing decades ago. Uh, the, the way that I kind of look at it is, is that in many ways, it's not a predictor of something, but rather you can observe the conditions of the existing market more with it uh, is the way I observe it. Any comment on what I said? I don't know if it changed. I, I do think that... It... Actually, you know, Patrick, I th your your comment about it being a player on the field is, is a great comment because it's increasingly these sorts of derivatives are becoming the tail that wags the dog. And maybe VIX is part of that. And so, yes, you're It's just correct. not a predictor anymore. Like, I don't like I to, don't know if I, it was ever a predictor. I, yeah, I, 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 I agree. It, I, it's a... Uh, I, I do, though, believe that the curve is giving you signals and that it is a potential uh, useful thing to watch and it's the shape of the curve more important than the, than the level right, Anyways, right. What, what but what about that final question are uh, following uh, indicators outside price and volume still considered technical analysis i don't know what does that mean like what is following indicators outside of price and volume well the um i guess it, it must be some sort of quantitative perspective uh the way i kind of look at it is technical analysis price time and volume and so the the time variable was excluded there but uh but ultimately uh Technical analysis, I think, it just in general, is the study of the actual movement and changes of the prices versus fundamentals, which is the underpinning valuations that one believes the asset is worth, right? And so yeah, I think there's a, a beautiful combination of the two. But you know, whether you're talking quantitative or uh, analysis, or like the quants putting stuff, I'm not sure what he meant, to be honest. I'm going to stop. You, you sound so much like Job in the Alliance of the Magicians demanding to be taken seriously <laughs> all right let's go to the next question greetings from finland here's my question what's the thing that will break in the coming months causing the fed to stop job owning and do what they'd have to do to keep the system running i don't know <laughs> I, Patrick, well, listen. If, if the, we if we knew if we knew what was going to break, then we would be billionaires and we wouldn't be doing this podcast. Uh, like ultimately, um, it, we're we're observing risks in the markets that something could break, but what it is going to break, I have no idea. Okay, I'll tell. I'll I'll take a shot at this one. Even though I don't think anything's going to break, I will first start by saying what's not going to break. What's not going to break is the banks. It won't be a repeat of 2008. Yes, I'll agree with it's, that it's always the, everyone always expects the last uh, crisis to reoccur. It never does. It's always something new. So if give you give giving you kind of that framework in that the, 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 the next crisis is always different from the first crisis or the previous crisis. Uh, what is a potential? One of the things that I'll throw out there uh, is private credit, private equity, private uh, venture capital. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to cause something that will be enough to, to influence the markets or the economy uh, to the point where the Fed stops doing, you know, stops raising rates. But if there was a kind of, if I had to put my check mark down on something, that's what I would choose. I love that meme where uh, where it shows Powell and it says, uh, "I'm going to keep raising rates till you guys stop uh, trading monkey picks." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, uh, it, but it, it's one of those things where uh, the 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 cheap credit created um, uh, robust bull markets in a whole set, a series of different parts of the asset markets, and and the raising of the rates. Uh, has to break a bunch of those things. Okay. Will, I, I will, they, will, will they break everything? Will everything lead to a crisis? Maybe not, but certainly the raising of rates is going to throw a wet blanket on a shitload of things that were working really, really well in the previous couple of years. I have my, my alternate, if I'm allowed two choices, 
So number one was private credit markets or private venture capital, just private markets in general. My number two choice is going to be uh, the long end of the bond market. Oh. So we, we get something like we had in UK, but we get that in the US. There you go. I'm um, listening. I, I just if, if, if it was I, I have a, a fur ball or something stuck in my. Throat. No, I understand. <laughs> if, if if it was something that everyone thought was going to happen, it couldn't happen. It was next question. Hi, Kevin, Patrick, and Lena. Each month, I listen to the chatter about economic performance waxing and waning like the rain on a tin roof as the relevant releases come and go. Come and go during the month. To be frank, I listen and each strident opinion seems believable at the time. Then the figures are released and there is a vapor trail of justification and derision of the Fed and other opinions. My question is, does the Fed have access to economic data that it relies on but does not share or publish with the Hoi Polloi or even Nick Timoros? On a separate note, I'd really like to express my thanks to your, for your funny, good-natured, affable podcast during the year. During drawdowns, like many, I look at Twitter and can see a morass of people screeching at each other, even people who seemed level-headed prior to the drawdown. You guys have provided a wonderful counterbalance to this, so thanks once again, though I do think you should try doing it weekly. Have a great holiday season. <laughs> Patrick, I'm did, gonna you, let you take did, did you write in again, Patrick? <laughs> no, I did not. I did. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first question is, oh, first of all, thank you for the kind words and, and they does mean a lot and we do try to make it, uh, fun. And most importantly is that we have fun doing it and, uh, it's nice that other people appreciate that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Anyway. Okay. Um, uh, Patrick got a taste of weekly and he's, I mean, bi-weekly and he's like, I'm not going back. Okay. Having Fridays off. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, so the first question is, is there figures, the figures, the figures, that are released um, that does the Fed have access to, but does not share or publish. Okay. I don't think that there's any specific indicators that the federal reserve would use as um, uh, and a, a kind of a, let's just say data to decide on policy. There would be nothing that policy decisions would make that that they're not sharing. Having said that, each Fed governor, president, I don't know what they're called, does phone um, constituents in their district. So the if you're sitting there in San Francisco you and you're the Fed president, you might be phoning Mark uh, Zuckerberg and asking him what he's seeing and and talking to him about his business. If you're the New York, if you're Fed, uh, John Williams at the Fed, New York Fed, you might be phoning Jamie Dimon and talking to, to him about what he's seen there. So there is anecdotal evidence that I'm not sure whether... It is um, actually recorded and published anywhere. I think it gets summarized in the beige book. And a lot of those, they will mention specific things. They won't say who they are, but a lot of times you can kind of guess who they are in terms of which CEO they're speaking to. But there definitely is that kind of anecdotal stuff. But I don't believe that anything uh, kind of hard data that they have would be such that they would keep it and make decisions based upon it and not share with the public. The whole idea about the Federal Reserve is that they're trying to be more and more open. They believe that by sharing their mythology, by sharing the data, by explaining what they're thinking, it actually makes the economy more efficient and it makes markets function better so it would be at the very opposite of what they believe in if they didn't do that all right i agree so then that's next question (laughs) that's a long one (laughs) hi lena kevin and patrick it feels like everyone is talking about the deflationary trending environment we in the u.s are already in and or that we will be in 2023 however it also seems like few are talking about the ssi 8.7 percent cost of living adjustment that U.S. seniors will be receiving in 2023, coupled with the compounding effects of the 2022 SSI 5.9% cost of living adjustment, it seems to me that inflation may have a chance to be more sticky in 2023 and beyond than fin Twitters are discussing. Retirees spend less money, true, but boomers still represent the largest wealth pool in the U.S. Also, wage inflation is still growing, albeit more slowly as boomers exit the workforce, which should also add a stronger demand. Shouldn't these side effects keep demand? Sorry, what's that? 
I was just joking because I think that he put side yeah. in parent, parent <laughs> So shouldn't visa. these effects keep <laughs> demand pressure on the ec- economy that forces the Fed to maintain higher rates for longer until something breaks? Or is it as simple as the boomers lost trillions in bonds and 60-40s this year? Stimmy, savings, and pent-up demand are in the rear view. Wage growth is slowing and layoffs are coming. So we are headed for less inflation in 2023. I understand that there is also a supply side to the equation, but it seems as though at least this demand narrative is not getting as much attention as perhaps it should. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for your insights. Keep up the great work and happy holidays. CJ in Chicago. P.S. Kev, that story about your daughter having a trader for a dad was awesome. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> trader spelled T-R-A-I-T-O-R. Traitor. <laughs> Traitor. <laughs> <laughs> and it um, wasn't just because I like the Winnipeg Jets over the Toronto Leafs. Um, uh, okay. Do you want me? No, you do. You go. Okay. Lots to, to do here. Um, one of the things that is difficult about when you talk about inflation and the markets, you have to differentiate between what's expected and what actually occur, where it comes in. So we could have a situation where... In the coming year, inflation goes down to two and a half percent, or let's say, let's what is it now? So it's seven or whatever. Let's say it goes down to five percent, and some people will say, "Look, inflation's coming down." But when you look, examine what uh, is built into the market, that would be a huge disappointment because the inflation swap market is actually priced in inflation almost returning to normal by the end of the year. I believe that uh, one year from now. The, the the CPI print will have a two and a half uh, hand, uh, percent uh, uh, kind of year over year figure. That's what they're expecting. Um, so you have to be careful when you're when you're talking about all these things and thinking about them. What you're whether you're talking about them in absolute terms or you're talking about them versus what the market is expecting. In terms of what the Fed um, would face, uh, like reading between the lines on this, it, it, one of the questions seems to be, is the Fed going to actually lower rates like the market expects, or are we going to have more inflation and, and it's going to mean that the Fed's going to have to stay higher for longer? I definitely fall into the latter camp. And I also fall into the latter camp in that inflation will prove stickier than every, than, than, than at least let's say than the market believes and that we will have, um, increasingly uh, bouts back up to four, five, six, seven, and maybe even higher again. But one of the things that I just want to talk about is the fact that it's difficult. Um, you know, like, how am I going to wear this? Patrick actually spoke about it briefly. He says that when you look at longer term things, you know, you could sit back and say, yeah, this is, you ended up being right, but it was five years later. And one of the things that that worries me about uh, inflation is that we could end up having a situation where for the next decade, inflation does end up being a problem. And it does average 5% instead of 2% as it has over the the previous decade. But in the meantime, we could have a spike, uh, you know, down to two and a half where everything looks rosy again. And that's likely what I think is going to happen is that we're going to see more volatility in the economy. So we will get more moves down to two and a half. Everyone will think it's fine. And then all of a sudden, this inflation will come back and it'll spike back up to five or seven or 10 percent. And if you go back and look at the 70s and especially the early 80s, this is what occurred, that that the the new um all these uncertainties that you mentioned will create more economic volatility and that'll be economic volatility on the plus and the minus. Hope that helped. All right. Uh, Let's go to the next one. Hi, what is going on with explosion of zero DTE option activity in the S&P? Is this generally stuff the market is shorting for juicy yield and avoid overnight margin while dealers are happy to collect a big spread on? Or is this more like degen YOLO gambling on big moves despite a very elevated implied. If the former, would this explain why we're seeing some huge moves without clear, strong catalysts as moderate moves can force false sellers to cover which snowballs throughout the day? 
or if the latter, are dealers forced to chase momentum to stay delta neutral intraday? I'm mostly wondering if this new activity either fattens or thins the tails of the daily moves. P.S. Is there an index like VIX for zero DT or any other expirations? Happy holidays. That's a great uh, question yeah. about the VIX. I don't think there is, but that someone should make it. Yeah, I, I, when I, I, while I love options and I use them quite a bit, I generally don't uh, specialize in this kind of. Um, well, it is analysis. for DGen Yolo gambling, um, mostly. Exactly. Like, yeah. It, and so uh, the only is, thing is I will, I don't have a, I, any smart really. Uh, well, I, I will comment that that um, on the S and P, it could be that there's actually sellers of that, meaning that there are. Uh, large institutions that will do systematic selling of short-term option, uh, you know, one day vol and they just do it over and over again, hoping to, to collect um, kind of uh, a premium for, for providing that insurance that the market might be looking for. Having said that, I think when you go look at, um, so in that case, by the way, that's a dampening situation. The, the market is, is um, institutions are providing volatility. Um, I think though that is a minor portion on the whole, I believe that most zero DT options are bought. Uh, I suspect that if you go look at uh, Tesla, that there's tons of uh, kind of degens that are buying one day ones as a way to trade as a way, be sorry, as a way to day trade as a way to, to, um, increase their, their margins to get more juice. And in that case, you're spot on correct that if they are buyers of those options, then we, that will increase the volatility because market makers will be short. And as it goes, it will find, they will find themselves having to chase rallies and sell yeah. uh, declines. Next question. But, very sh but it's very short term. Yeah, uh, I, I actually influence. don't think that that's. I think part of the question asked is this the reason we're seeing more of these moves? I actually don't think so, especially yeah. in the S and P five hundred. I think it has more to do with just the increasing amount of options that that people are trading, and the dealers end up having large, large, large books, and those even just even though they're trading one or five month or seven month options, they end up uh, still having to chase markets because the positions are so large. All right, Lena, you know, next one. Dear Patrick and Kevin, having been mainly short the NASDAQ and long energy, it seems that absent any major changes in the final days, I have been lucky closing the year 2022 with a positive performance. Do you guys give any indication on your annual performances? Have you ever had a down year? What do you think is a reasonable performance expectation for a sophisticated investor managing his own funds? All the best for the ho holy day <laughs> and a new year. Wow. Do you want to go, I Patrick? Mean well, I've I've had down years, so like I mean, in the end, yeah. Uh, so I I think everybody's had down years. Like, uh, I well, I I now to be fair, I went a long time without a, without a down year, and it actually probably was to my detriment because you start to actually think you're smart, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you have to be careful about that. One of the things that the 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 fellows asking a question about what would be a reasonable performance yeah. expectation that's ends up being so personal because and not yeah, personal in that, that people don't want to say it but personal in terms of what they are willing to live with i know people that literally have five ten percent days like you know they'll make or lose five or ten percent a day and they regularly have 100 200 percent years and they can live with that. And then there's other people that I know that if they make 20% in a year, they consider it great. And they, and they just, they want their payoff to be, uh, I'm going to lose five or 10 on a bad year and I'm going to make 20 on a good year. And so, so Kevin, like to me, uh, I, the way I like to explain it to my members is the first thing we do is we make market calls. We basically look for setups. We look for what we think the market will do. Where's the asymmetric trade? But then the implementation uh, is all where um, that, that return function comes in because one could execute it as a small portion of their account and clip a 1% move on, let's say, gold rising 10% because they took such a small position in their portfolio while you have others that 
believe in concentration, take big positions. Then you have the next level, which is people not only do concentration, but then leverage themselves. Then others go into derivatives markets and put on those trades with, with uh, you know, uh, all sorts of more sophisticated ways. It's all the same call on the same move of the same asset, but the way you implement the trade determines what your ultimate return is. And the return is always a function of how much risk you're willing to take. Uh, uh, and, um, and so to say what should a sophisticated investor be targeting, uh, I don't think uh, it all depends. Like if I was trading, you know, a billion, I would have a far different target than if I was trading a hundred grand. Yeah, no, uh, it, no doubt like, about it. And then not only that, the other part that you, as you were explaining that, I was thinking about it's really a function of of your drawdowns, meaning like how much yeah. risk are you taking to to achieve that? And when people say, "Oh, I had a hundred percent year," I go, "Great. Well, you had a hundred percent year, but what was your drawdown? If you're down, if you're having drawdowns that are seventy percent, then the hundred percent doesn't year doesn't mean crap. Like I know there's a um uh. There's, 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 uh, let's say commodity, uh, specialists that have done really well on the, this, uh, during this energy bull market, like really well, like funds that are up to 300%, but go and look at the, what, what that fund was, how they did during, uh, 2020 or the, the years before. Yeah. A lot of those funds will have drawdowns that are huge. And so you end up being uh, down uh, on the whole because even though you end up having this terrific performance this year, you had a terrible performance last year. And so one of the things that you just when you're when you're thinking about your performance is that you have to measure it on a risk adjusted basis. And back to your point, Patrick, is that you dial your risk and you decide. And then from and there, you decide. What makes, what makes a sophisticated investor is you know how to size the trade based upon the goals that you have. It's not about a number. It's about the fact that you've been given a certain amount of money to manage or you have a certain amount of capital. You're targeting a certain return. And when you make a market call, you size the trade correctly for what expectation and what risk you're willing to think. I think what makes you sophisticated is knowing what the risk is, how to size it, how to manage it. That's what makes you sophisticated, not the percentage number okay we're gonna leave it there because that's a perffect answer Patrick next question all right hi market huddle I c commute a long way each day so I've listened to listened on my drive diligently for the last few years the drop to a bi-weekly podcast has been devastating for me because I have to find out alternative sources of content that has not gone so great Anyway, my stupid question. One of the best insights that I heard on the show was when Patrick once said that the hardest part of... Okay, he's lying. He's <laughs> no. lying. Pa best Patrick insights. wrote this in. Coming from me? What's going on? No, no. Okay, so Patrick once said that the hardest part of trading is knowing when to sell as opposed to knowing when to buy. He never followed up on that, though, with wisdom about when to sell so do so do you have rules of rules of thumb for when you take profit what parameters do you use to let winners run versus selling your position any guidance beyond the usual aphorisms like plan your exit when you first enter because i am mediocre at that too <laughs> i think that's actually do you plan your exit when you first yes. enter because oh absolutely oh i don't i think that's wrong i uh, no, i i it's, why it's, because well now now we we're getting into uh, the secret sauce here, buddy. But uh, but there's uh, symmetry in markets and other things. Like there's there's a point where once a rally has reached a certain point, there the asymmetry is no longer in your favor. Fine, you have a big cushion of profits that you're sitting on. But let let me uh, look at. Let's say you wrote a stock from a hundred to a hundred and fifty. Uh, right. And, and you, you, you made a great call, great move. You're up 50% on the move. Now, fine. Over a long period of time, that stock may still go higher. But the question is, is that as that stock goes to 150, there might be incrementally, uh, you know, 20 more dollars on the upside, but there's increasingly a chance that you're, it's going to give $30 back. As the stock is going higher and higher, you are, the, the, uh, the payoff profile is dynamically changing. There's a point where even if you're close to the top but not at the top, you're, you're taking way too much risk for too little potential gain. It's, it's stupid.
stupid not to sell. You have to have a plan for for where you reach that point, and that that's something that I do a lot of. And no. uh, and you you might have a different methodology, but I uh, plan my exits for sure. Well, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. I don't plan them. I don't even think about them. I I think yeah. all about the downside. Well, I think the about the fact that you're. Look, there's, there's the, the beautiful thing that, you know, Kev, and what, what's so amazing about having so many smart guests join us on this is, is, uh, is like, I, I've never really met two traders that trade the same. Yeah. Every one of us is as unique as our fingerprint. And each of us finds our own way of, of uh, kind of approaching the markets. The key is you have to find something that kind of matches your personality, something that, that, that just makes sense to you because when fucking the bullets are flying over your head and the chaos of live markets are going, you have to be able to stick to a certain amount of rules and you have to have that and you can't go and follow someone else's sauce without having developed your own way of, uh, of, uh, of fighting in the trenches, yeah. right? I, I'm just surprised that you actually have a number. I didn't expect that at all. Yeah, I did. I I, and for me, I just kind of look at it. I go, okay, I think this is a bull setup. I think the fundamentals are lining up, and I also think that um, the technicals look okay. And I'm going to get in. And when 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 those things don't no longer drive, is it was when I'll get out. And so to me, I kind of more I, I think about it just on a daily basis. Like, is this still? Am I still bullish? Is the technical still good? Uh, and, and, and I guess, I guess I, I guess maybe I should come up with some targets. Maybe, uh, uh that'll be my new no, year's no, no, resolution. Don't, don't start changing. If, if, if what you're doing is working for you, don't fuck with it. Just <laughs> anyway, let's go to the next question. Have been listening for at least a year. Still, I am unable to distinguish Kevin from Patrick when they speak <laughs> a mind boggling similarity in tone, style, technical deficiency, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> Nina, can you help me out? How do you tell these two apart when not in their presence? P.S. More copy. So I think that this fellow well, it's was a question. It's a question for Lena. Why are you answering Lena? Oh, I'm question? sorry, Lena. Go ahead and answer the question. <laughs> I get paid to distinguish. <laughs> oh, that's perfect answer. I, I, perfect answer. I understand that we are similar. I get it. But it's 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 you guys have very different voices. To me, yeah. you guys are. It's very easy to tell. But I don't know how to explain. Well, it. and then the other thing that's easy to tell is that if any if any sort of bullish m- words come out of my mouth, you know it's me, <laughs> Kevin, and, and it's not Patrick. And if he starts talking about how the world's ending and that uh, you know you should buy bonds, yeah, the bearish and you should yeah, buy yeah, U.S. Absolutely. dollars, and it's Patrick. Uh, the other one is is that if if it sounds like uh, you know the the one kid from the Family Guy, then you know it's Kevin. <laughs> that's right. Or maybe it's, you both <laughs> sound like the kid from Family Guy, and that's why they can't. Oh, don't say that. It can't be me. No, because <laughs> well, we sound like. I did find it interesting. I thought it had to do with the fact that um, people that aren't from Canada would might have more trouble. But I believe that this person was actually a Canadian. Unbelievable. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Next question. Hi, guys. I have a question for Patrick. I am curious oh. about the concept of, quote unquote, overhead supply, and I'm wondering how long it takes to dissipate. Looking at the multi-year chart of Peabody Energy, BTU, I think I see a giant cup and handle followed by a second handle at a higher level. But the price was even higher back in 2018. Does this mean there is overhead supply, or should I assume that most of most or all of those 2018 buyers have sold their shares by now? I think when you go and look at uh, that large of a time frame, you have to recognize that uh, fundamentals do matter over uh, you know levels where people were buying in 2018. I mean, a lot has happened in like uh, that 2018 to 2020 bear market in Peabody had the thing literally drop to a dollar. Uh, and it was on the verge of uh, like, what I uh, Kev. I think we looked at the credit default swaps once uh, on the show on Peabody when it was down there. It was like eleven percent that they were going to default in within a year or something. Uh, point is, is is that uh, there's a fundamental story now developing that loud coal to turn. And the point I'm making is is that I wouldn't weigh too heavily 
on um, uh, levels that Peabody traded back in 2018. Now, it does influence traders because a lot of traders do look at charts and previous highs become levels where naturally uh, there's an increased probability that traders may make a sell decision, but I wouldn't overweigh it. Oh, that sounds good. And that one's for you. So let's go to the next one. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Question number one. First, a theoretical question. I have always been under the impression that all else aside, if you are buying an option, you are giving up a small amount of edge to the seller of the option who gains some edge. Is there any truth to this? If so, roughly how big of an edge does the seller have over the buyer? And in which time frames or situations is this phenomenon most pronounced? Finally, if you buy an out of the money call or put, but seller, but sell a further out of the money call or put with the same expiration is the is the edge then theoretically lost or is it just lessened because you are putting more money into the option sold than the option bought? Well, Kev, I mean, you could you could give your side of it, but I I think that in the over the long uh, period uh, that options are right priced. And that uh, to say that one side has an edge or another would be something that would be arbed out in, uh, if there was truly an edge. Is that statement, do you have a pushback on that statement? Uh, no, but I, can, I, can I give my uh, yeah. um, shot at explaining this? I think that the reason that there's been an impression that buying an option gives up an edge to the seller of the option is because on the whole... There was more buyers than sellers in options usually. These were products that were created in it and, and really it was just market makers on the other side of the options. And there was uh and and for them to take that risk, they had to offer the option at a price that was above what was quote unquote fair value. Having said that, as the market has become more sophisticated and more diverse, you're actually getting big, large institutions come in and systematically sell options. And not only that, all of this is just an assumption of what future volatility will be. So I might argue that when volatility went down to 10% or whatever it was, 12% in the right before the VIX of Volmageddon, that the seller of the option was the one that was giving up an edge because they were selling it at such a ridiculous price. Because let's face it, we are always guessing what future option, uh, future volatility will be. And the only reason that there used to be an edge because of uh, the buyer was because there was more buyers than sellers and it was had to be artificially created with market makers on the other side. As we get more and more natural sellers, it can actually go the other way and there's nothing stopping. If all of a sudden, like we had in the Volmageddon, right before Volmageddon, everyone wanted to sell Vol to actually gather premium, there actually could be an edge the other way. Right. Okay. So wait, there's a second uh, was, question was, from okay, this listener. For now, a personal question: What is the best edge each of you ha ever had, and how long did it last? Thanks, everyone. Uh, you you first. <laughs> Jeez, I've had a lot. I I had a I I thought about this. I've before. never I've never measured uh, it that way. Like ultimately, uh, I still have. Uh, my trading is still very much intuitive, even though I have a very specific technical methodology uh, that I use. Uh, how I size my trade or how much conviction I have is intuitive based upon you know where I think we are in macro and other things. And so it's hard for me to answer that question. I don't know if I... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go because I had more like actual yeah. edges. Um the first one was uh, the what we call the interlisted arbitrage machine, and in Canada, there's there's stocks that are listed in both Canada and the U.S. And for many many years, uh, there would be people that would sit on a phone and uh, buy and sell, and then arbitrage it with you know they sit on a phone in Toronto and then talk to the New York Stock Exchange and have someone else sitting on the phone, and they would arbitrage back and forth between there. 
in the mid nineties, I was at a dealer and I decided that uh, it was at the, uh, just at the beginning of electronic trading. And I said, Oh, you know what? I, I, I can, I can program this up. So we actually programmed up uh, an interlisted art machine. And I still remember my, the head of risk or the head of compliance actually saying, what are you doing over there? And I said, oh, I'm writing this program to do this. And he said, why are you doing that? I already have 13 guys to do that. Well, the reality is that the program and the box was way, way faster. And the amount of money that thing made was obscene. Like it was, it was a true perfect arbitrage because you bought the stock, you sold it in, in New York, and then you hedged out the currency, and there was nothing left afterwards. There was, it wasn't like some theoretical arb where you have to wait till it expires. It was just pure perfect arb, and that edge lasted for a long time. It actually lasted until HFTs came. And then HFTs, in, in essence, did the same thing and they figured it out. And that was a terrific our, our, our edge. So that thing, but listen, it decayed every single year. It just kept decaying, 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 decaying. Like as, 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 as more and more people figured it out, as computers got faster, it just was constant decay. The other our, uh, um, edge that I had was at one point, I was the market maker for the... Canadian equivalent of the spider and we had to do index rebalances and at this point uh, there was no there was no MOC function believe it or not in Toronto so it was like every close was like a gun uh, like like a gunfight at the OK Corral it was absolutely just stocks flying everywhere um, but the thing was that because we had the largest book and we had the most orders that we were able to control it better than um, the people with the smaller ones. So the smaller orders. So it ended up being that we drove those things for a long time and there was a huge edge there. It was eventually uh, rightfully eliminated when they made the MOC function. And uh, I think that was a great thing for the market. And uh, it's just, it's an example of how, um, the regulators and the and the exchanges were slow to do that, and they should have had that much earlier because it would have been better for the marketplace. So, so the one thing, though, that I would like to make a statement you could push back on if you want, but uh, I think every edge inevitably ends. Uh, and otherwise, one is, and often it could be by size. You know, once you have an edge and you just keep going, you keep pressing it, and once you become too big. It's impossible for the rest of the market participants not to see you. You become the whale. Like, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, ultimately- I, I would, ag- I would agree there. And I also think that eventually it leaks out. And everyone yeah, always I mean, says it, it, it always ends. Yeah. Bottom. And listen, one of the things I always said, people would say uh, to me, oh, you were so lucky to be around at that time. If I was around, then I would have programmed all this stuff and made a fortune. And I said, no, you know, like it wasn't that easy. People weren't doing this. It was, it was, it was cutting edge to be going and doing the program trading and to be doing the, the auto trading. And I know now it seems quaint, but at the time that was, that was tough. And I always say to them, there is somebody today that is the, my equivalent of what I was doing back in the nineties. There's the, the same type of person doing something today that they are telling nobody about nobody. And they are just minting it. And I don't know if they're at Renaissance, they're at Citadel, who knows? But there's somebody doing it. The point is that the it's the markets are always tough, but there's always something there. There's always an ability to make money, and there always is an edge. But you're absolutely right, Patrick, that it very well not very quickly. It depends on how the type of edge it is, but it eventually gets arbed away. Yeah. All, All right, Lena. Next question. Do you think that the Bank of Japan raising its yield curve control target to 0.5 percent is a big deal? Is it a one-off event or the first of several steps? If it is significant, what do you think are the market implications? Thank you for a highly informative, entertaining podcast. Best wishes for the new year. Okay, this one's in my wheelhouse, Patrick. I'm taking this one. Okay, do I think that the Bank of Japan raising its yield curve control to 5.5% is a big deal? Yes and no. I think that it is a big deal in that it is a sign that they're finally changing policy. 
Uh, the next qu- part of the question is, is it a one-off event or the first of several steps? It is definitely the latter. It is the first of several steps. And so therefore it was a big deal because it ended up being the signal that things were about to change. Okay. Now at the very, in the early days of, uh, you know, the, the, the switch, the market got really excited and, and tried to push it above 0.5 and started talking about what a big deal it was. And I was saying, no, no, this is just going to be the excitement is going to be over. And then we're going to have to wait another three months or whatever until the next part of it occurs. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Having said that, I, I really do think that we are about to experience a dramatic transformation at the Bank of Japan and Japanese assets in general, and that uh, you will continue to see more and more moves like that. And there will be more and more opportunities in Japan. And I, I, I love Japanese financials. I know Patrick hates like anything financial, no. uh, you know, but actually, you, you know what, Patrick, can you get up um, Japanese um, yeah, uh, like, like charts? Yeah. Which one? Okay, so 1615, I was lucky enough a subscriber showed me that there's an ETF on the uh, Japanese Topics Bank Index, which I had no clue about. So I now oh, own this because I'm like, this is great. Look at this thing. Like, um, Is this the right one? 16, no, no, Japan. I don't know what you're looking at, AB Builders. Hold on a second here. You, gotta, uh, you know what? I think you went Hong Kong. You need to do Japan. Could be wrong. Uh, the Numura, Numura asset? It could be. Let me, yeah, that's it. That's it. This one here. Yeah. Okay. So give me your... Uh, give me your. That's a very bullish chart, buddy. Yeah. But Hello? now, I'd, there's no asymmetry in buying it now. This is where I would be selling. But, uh, like, I would be, I would be hedging or, or lightning, but it's been a great run. Like, uh, those two, uh, there was two very distinct buying opportunities uh, in the last couple of years, for sure. But, uh, like, uh, let's just look at here on the daily chart, because we, it was on the weekly. But, yeah, wow. Beautiful move. Congratulations for being long this. Well, I, you know what? I, I wasn't long that particular thing, because... Um... I didn't know this existed till this week. So I, I <laughs> okay. so I've been long Japan, but I have not been long this. Um, so I'm going to put I, this on my uh, watch list. This is pretty cool. Lena, let's go down to the next one. Hi, gang. Thankful I stumbled across this degenerate, but a hugely educational and entertaining podcast in 2022. Easily the highlight of my podcast rotation. Even though I Thank listened you. to Patrick's crayon session first, first for most episodes, I'm no trader and aim to be more of a cyclical investor, holding my trades for three to five years across big themes. I'm licking my lips to invest heavily into copper miners for another long-term trade, but the recession chatter has me confused. The last few years taught me that the macro overpowers that the macro overpowers everything, but the supply demand situation in the copper space is de-risking the trade, in my opinion. Any views on when to pile into this trade over the next twelve months, and how do you balance macro versus fundamental setups in the commodity sector more broadly well i agree with uh, a lot of the things he says here like i mean there are big macro stories and that's where the big money is and that's what we always try to catch is those big trend moves that allow you to capitalize on those and i think the i i'm in that camp i think kev you're in the same camp as me but overall i believe that there's um, uh, every opportunity for there to be a secular bull market in commodities that continues for the rest of the decade and so our listeners on the right track my biggest problem is is pigeonholing yourself into a three to five year time frame uh, because during those periods are these multi-year trends that emerge that uh, uh, can have very deep uh, uh, corrections along the way that make it incredibly painful. And so you, if you, you either have to have some sort of a tactical approach, like I know some value investors that just live by that and hold that time frame. But uh, overall, for me, I, I just, um, I, I, I like to see where the technicals line up with those macro and fundamentals. How about you? Well, I think there's nothing wrong with using technicals as a trigger. But having said that, if 
I hate to miss it because you ended up waiting for the squiggles to align properly in terms of what you like. If you like it, you buy it. And I and the other thing is that uh, if you start to get worried because you know like the doom fintwit macros uh people have got you scared about the economy and then meanwhile we get this huge copper bull market run even in the face of uh, them being correct about the economy going down you'll never forgive yourself if it's cheap it's cheap and you should buy it like so uh, maybe with maybe with a little bit of um with a little bit of technicals and a little bit of stops and don't add to it. Don't go in and, and, and make a plan going in like saying, okay, I'm going to buy a certain amount here and I won't add to it till it's profitable or, or something make a plan and, and don't just be stubborn about it. But having said that I would be really careful about letting macro themes in terms of like worries about the economy influence it. Like I, I hear all sorts of, folks tell me something has to happen because of xyz and then it just ends up being that that's the exact point where all of a sudden that relationship breaks you know i want to push back on like the one thing that that you know you kind of like uh, you fear missing it because like the technical squiggles don't line up but uh, uh, but ultimately I, I i'll push back because technicals can give you very good early signals to to uh, be getting into a trend shift. I mean, the bottom line is markets go through uh, accumulation cycles, bull cycles, distribution cycles, and bear cycles, and they go through them uh, uh, over and over again. And the technicals are a roadmap for being able to try to identify which stage of these cycles that you're in. And the thing is, is that, you know, if you, by price level alone, saying that something is good and worth buying, you could still get drawn down 50% buying your theme because you uh, you uh, stepped in front of a train going you know 100 kilometers an hour down the tracks and you were thinking this is where it's going to stop like you uh, I just think that uh, uh, there's early signals you can still get that gets you in very early with technicals and so uh, I'm not disagreeing Patrick I'll say though I'd rather go and use the technicals than the macro because I think the macro a lot of times uh, people believe that because of the macro has to occur, this ha this is my belief about the the macro. So therefore, the copper has to do this. That could be a point where all of a sudden the copper versus everything else relationship breaks, and it could break because of the very reasons that you're bullish on it. And like that goes back to our gold trade, right? Like you know, I I'm bullish on gold. I'm really hesitant to go and to sell gold because rates are up. Because yeah. I, I think that, that 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 relationship to rates could break, and therefore I almost you know kick myself if I'm bullish and for the it goes up for the reasons I'm bullish, and yet therefore uh, rates you know this worry about rates ends up scaring me. Anyways, yeah. the long and short of it is that if you have a trade because of the macro, then that's one thing. But if you have a trade because of the fundamentals, don't let your macro get in the way. Yeah. All right. Last question. As this is a series of four, four, four questions in one package for our last Damn question. It. I thought it was one last question. <laughs> so keep it tight. Hey, all. A few opinions I would like to hear from you. How would you summarize 2022 economically in the market, geopolitics, culture, etc.? What are the big themes we are going to reflect on in December 2023? What assumptions is the market making that is not true? For example, global households generally have strong enough balance sheets to weather a mild downturn without re reducing spending. What are you looking forward to in the coming year? What is a story from 2022 you will not forget? Can be personal, markets, general headlines, anything. Happy New Year to my favorite market podcast. Okay, so we'll think wow. it tight. How would you summarize 2022, Patrick? Well, I mean, obviously, it uh, was uh, bond carnage. Like, uh, forget every other market. Like, uh, the most extraordinary bond drop. Uh, how, how many? Uh, when was the last time we saw a bond market drop of this kind of magnitude? It was like in the 1800s or something. It was a long yeah. time ago. Uh, this is it's um, even a bond past crash. the. That's that's how you summarize. Like, uh, it's one of the a uh, huge rate hike cycle. Like, because everything that happened. Uh, is subsequently, I think, in some degree or another, a byproduct of the bond crash. I don't disagree with that. I would add the fang mats and the collapse of the whole tech dream stocks. Like I would put ARK 
and uh, all those stocks collapsing. The ch- the the bloom coming off of Tramath ch- ch- and all those things I th- think should be included in there. Okay, so what are the big themes we're going to l- reflect on if we do this again in December of 2023 or January in our case? Because we'll, we're going to miss it again. So uh, my call yeah. is something breaks. There's still a bear market, but 2023 will uh, highlight some of the most extraordinary buying opportunities uh, in particularly a lot of the commodities that might get drawn down at liquidity events and other things. And if you can time it right, there's going to be some really big money rate. But I still think uh, there's just uh, too many things that can still on the short term go wrong. So I think it's something that happens throughout the year. And I think if you can call it right, there's some really big money to be made. Okay, I, I will say that on the whole, I'm going to stick to my theory that it's going to be boring um, in terms of uh, big macro moves. We're going to be surprised at how boring it is. Uh, if we are looking for something that would be uh, a surprise, that's a big theme that we're going to reflect on, it's going to be the carnage in the in the private uh, the private markets, whether that be uh, VCs, uh, PE, or uh, debt. I think that's going to be the surprise. And then I will say one last thing. And I wrote about this recently. Uh, in 2001 and 2002, we saw some really big accounting scandals. Like we had uh, Enron, we had Tyco, we had WorldCom. These were huge t- uh, scandals. I think that we're going to have our generation of big scandals that will revealed. yeah, start to get revealed this year. I don't know I, what they I, are. Well, actually, yep. I do have a guess on one, but uh, but that's uh, you know people don't go through it. Don't go through it. Okay, so what's the next uh, one? What assumptions is the market making that is not true? And I see that this fellow sounds like he's in your uh, camp, Patrick. He says, "E.g., uh, global households generally have strong enough balance sheets to weather a milder downturn without re- reducing spending." So he's assuming that that's the market believes that, but he that that might not be true. What is your I, I agree. I, I basically think uh, the theory that uh, it's all been priced in, that the market is already showing soft landing. Uh, I just I honestly believe that we uh, still have not seen the implications of the rate hike cycle and the move in interest rates. And uh, the idea that their soft landing is the, the base case is nonsense. I think that the downturn will be worse. Well, and I, I kind of will push push back on that. And I think that the, one of the assumptions the market is making is that what Patrick has just discussed is it's somewhat already built into the market in that the Federal Reserve is scheduled to what uh, cut rates 50 basis points in the second half of 2023. I'm going to take the other side of that and say that that doesn't happen. And I realize yeah. that that's kind of it's a scary thought and it's scary in that it means that uh, you're pushing back against the the doom fin twit doom crowd that believes that it's, the world's going to end and that you got to make all your money by being long euro dollar or now so for futures. But I'm going to push back and say that that trade doesn't work. And I might All look right. like a complete so fool. What are you what? looking forward to ne- uh, in the coming year? I already made my call earlier. I basically think that even though I uh, fall into the camp that things get worse, I also think that uh, particularly if a liquidity event occurs, many of the big picture secular bull markets in commodities are going to cause many amazing buying opportunities in that space. And I think that one of the things I'm looking forward to is some of the amazing buying opportunities that will arise from that is my view. What's uh, what Well, I'm going to say this and I was worried I was going to go it, but I realized that we're doing it no matter what. I'm looking forward to the Wagyu steak with the chimichurri sauce. <laughs> I am too. It's just who's going to pay for it. Is yeah. The bigger question. Uh, no. So seriously, <laughs> what am I looking forward to? So I'm looking forward to Patrick eating his words because financials end up being a great trade. Oh. Uh, that would be <gasps> one. Of, that would be <gasps> one of them. I, I, I think that there's going to be uh, an increasing. Uh, so what, uh, here's another thing I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to a market that is increasingly efficient. Meaning that in the uh, I the 2021 or 2020 and 2021 saw some of the stupidest shit that I've ever seen in terms of market reaction. Like people would get on to CNBC, say the stock is going higher because of X, Y, Z. And then the stupid thing is it would go all higher for like days to come, even though it was all just bullshit. And it's now all giving it up. And for 
people that were assuming the market was efficient in, in, in my case, in the old days, when an analyst would come up on CNBC and say something was a buy and then all of a sudden the thing would move up three dollars, you would sell it because you would realize that that it probably had moved too much and that it wasn't going to move immediately that amount. Uh, I, I like the return of efficient markets. I like that we see um, people, markets that shouldn't be funding themselves are no longer funding themselves. I like it that we're seeing things like AMC versus Ape, you know, the, that stupid yeah. spread, uh, which is in essence the exact same security. Like why, the, like that security, if you go look at Ape versus AMC, it is the exact same security. It should be bang on, like within a penny of each other. Instead, it went to a spread of $10. All those sorts of nonsense are coming down, coming out of the market. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Okay, what so is a story, story okay, from 2022 that you will not forget? Can be personal markets, general headlines, anything. Elon Musk, man of the year. At the start of the <laughs> ah, that's a good uh, one. start of the year, the 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 second one is uh, crypto blowing up with FTX. Uh, oh, that's well, a good I one. I won't forget. I won't forget that. And obviously, Kathy Wood still being bullish on her stocks all years uh, uh, is. I won't forget that one either. Anything yeah, uh, what's, uh, I I guess agree with all those. I agree with all those. Uh, I would say, of course, you're you were the bond market because you you made stupid. No, I'm going to say bond. though, what's a story that I won't forget is that uh, the the Ukraine war, right? Like that ended up oh. being such a huge portion of uh, of it yeah. drove markets, it drove the people, it, it it changed the world in terms of how we think about a lot of different things. Uh, I I suspect that that would be the number yeah. one for me. All right. All right. Well, that was a good way to end it, actually. That was, yeah, uh, that was terrific. Good. All right. Okay. Nina, where can they submit their questions? <laughs> so if you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, please submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Uh, and this is the point where I should be saying all the nice stuff, but I've completely forgotten and I've lost the script. So folks, thanks for tuning in. It's just a pleasure to have you. Uh, this is kind of a delayed year end one. So we'll just say thank you for all your support throughout the year. It means a lot to us. Um, you can go check us out on Twitter. Uh, Lena and Patrick are still there doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, so Lena's there at the market huddle and Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me at bigpicturetrading.com or you can follow me at Twitter at Patrick Ceresnik. Kev, where can they follow you, buddy? Well, they should go to the macrotourist.com and, or you can go to Substack and I, I encourage people that, that are interested. Uh, it's, you know, Substack's becoming like Google. It's become a verb. Uh, but the, one of the things they have is a chat group and you can go and I see more and more Substackers doing the chat like i i know that this wouldn't excite you but i saw uh, uh stephanie kelton doing the chat the other day and it's, it's literally it's it's nice because you get none of the russian or chinese troll bots uh hounding you it's just people that are interested in uh talking about markets and it, it ends uh, up how here. long will that last that's a, yeah. that <laughs> that's true <laughs> Anyways, listen, thank you everyone for all your support throughout the oh, year. And, and Happy uh, New Year. Let's make 2023 a prosperous one. Uh, and we appreciate all the listeners and all the feedback we get. It's, that, it's, it's so great. awesome. And if it's not proper, prosperous, at least let's make it fun. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, let's keep this. So listen, I, I'm going to just quickly rate uh, last week's beer. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm literally going to score it poorly. I'm going to give it a, a 5.5. Uh, it, it was disappointing. Yeah, like, I feel like that's a, like a really mopey uh, uh, score. Because if you if it is that disappointing, it should be sub five. No, I didn't hate it. It yeah, was listen. disappointing it's still that beer. it didn't. <laughs> yeah, it's still beer, Patrick. But, but it's everybody just, I knows we more. don't get paid for the the market the the beer yeah. sponsor. So you, okay, four point four. Okay, well, no, it's too late. You can't change. Well, I, I liked my f score. You made me feel stupid. I know, but you should it. you shouldn't let me influence you. You should just take oh. it. You should take the mopey. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm I'm mopey. Fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just talk to Lena oh. you, uh, or Patrick since Patrick's getting more. Well, no, listen, I just wanted to tell the story. Like, so last week, our last episode, we talked about it, but, uh, I, for months was planning my trip to, uh, Argentina, uh, to, uh, Buenos Aires. And I landed in the city on the day they won the world cup. Oh, that's awesome. Well, uh, and I was there fucking partying with uh, at, at one point they said it was five million people on the streets 
uh, and I had a downtown hotel. I want you to understand yeah, so how fucking to- hard <laughs> it is to get downtown with five million people on the street, no cars able to think. Like, uh, did you just like you get you get you close and then just say walk the rest? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, with, a, and you had all but, your luggage. But you know what? But the thing is, is it wasn't no, um, you know, like uh, burning cars, uh, uh, kind of France Moroccan party. Well, France, stuff. forget like, about France. We do that it, here in Vancouver. Yeah, like, <laughs> but uh, it was uh, the, the Argentinian people were just so happy. Like oh. it was, uh, it was a, uh, it was a. Uh, while it was huge crowds, it was just. Uh, it was love and happiness. There was no like it, it didn't feel when you're in those crowds that there was any danger. Just so many people having such a great time. So and congratulations to all of them down there. And I was I, I feel honored that I got to be there to be a part of that. That was so, so cool. So Lena, when I hear Patrick talking about all the love and happiness, I all I can wonder is who slipped up the Molly. <laughs> I know. I was thinking the same thing. You need to go get yourself checked and get full screened. (laughs) See what kind of diseases you picked up. I can't. I'm going to make no comment. (laughs) Oh, man. That's awesome, though. Like, you just never know. (laughs) You need a tetanus shot. I don't know. But it was all love and happiness. (laughs) They're just love. I was trying to say something nice. I couldn't. Uh, uh, anyway, that, uh, that's great that you were there. And and for those uh, who, th- you know, Patrick's claiming that it was uh, internet that didn't work last week, but we all know it was just a huge hangover from the party. Well, no, that was. Uh, that's why he yeah, couldn't figure out difference. the internet connection. That's why. Yeah, that's connect. right. Nah, no, to be fair, the, that, that, you, I was in Rio at the time, and you that should was, shame. Uh, that's a whole you should shame problem. the 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 uh, hotel company that did this. Like literally, it was Hilton, and yeah. honestly, I will never fucking buy that stock again. Like <laughs> honestly, you should short uh, it. You should be even worse. I, you I am be honestly it. thinking of shorting Hilton. You it should was hate short it. Uh, I, listen, I, I'm going to throw a little bit of hate out. Like uh, that was probably one of my worst hotel experiences. It, it, and it was one of the high end rated, you know, four and a half star uh, hotels that, out, out there. A beautiful location, by the way. And uh, and they did throw an amazing New Year's party. So like there are some there was it was it was pretty cool. But 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 honestly, it felt like I was staying at Disneyland. Like they heard their their uh, um, people around the lineups and the breakfast thing was like honestly trying to get on a Disney ride. Uh, it was uh, and, and the, they they're trying to manage so many people that they don't give any attention to you. So you know I have an internet problem. How the fuck am I dealing with it? Like there's a lineup of thirty people at the front reception. You got to go see the mouse. <laughs> anyway, I. Uh, I was very disappointed with the hotel. Well, it's uh, I'm a seller on the on Hilton. Now. Everything was okay. great, but there were so many people at New Year's. Yeah, and <laughs> That's it was like <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's no, no. It, it wasn't the fact. It, it's look. They, that's the capacity of the hotel. It wasn't like there were people uh, out on the streets, right? Like this is the hotel right. managing their new topic. Right, we start, we, new sh- topic. we shame them enough. <laughs> yes. Did you uh, did you see any good movies or anything? Probably not. You're too busy partying. No, I didn't watch it. How about you, Lena? Um, I finally caved and started watching Yellowstone. Oh, did you like it? Did you like it? Oh my god, it's so good. Really? Oh, it's so good. I didn't think oh, I was I gonna did. like it so much. Oh. You have a thing for Kevin Costner and the older guys, don't you? I didn't until I watched the show. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna I lie. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, Kevin Costner looks good for his sixties. All right. I went and saw, um, this is how exciting I am. Uh, I went and saw, uh, what is it? The whale. The whale. I was writing about the option whale so much. I was like, I'm going to go see the whale. It's uh, the one with the, with the, the, what's the guy's name? Oh man. What's it about? No, I'm, I feel like I've it, heard well, about it, but I don't know. I can't remember. What uh, the whale. Let me just get the guy's name. Everyone that's listening to this is like, God damn it. Oh, it's Brendan. Blah, 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 blah. Brendan uh, there, what's his name? there it is. Brendan Fraser. Right. And it's um, about a fellow that basically uh, enjoys his food. And it was uh, difficult to watch and difficult to uh, difficult physically and emotionally to watch. But it was terrific. Like, I really like it. Is this going to make me want to eat more food? No. Oh. No, no. It's the other way around. Oh. Yeah. All right. Anyways, <laughs> it, it was. It's, listen, it was a really good movie, but it's very 
very it's disturbing oh. as well as a way to go with it yeah yeah it's disturbing to watch and but it's but it's a good flick and actually the young da- the young daughter in it what's her name because she was terrific sadie sink and she's in something she's in i think she's in something like uh uh, oh, we're doing really bad. Everyone's like, God damn it. She's yeah. in blah, blah, blah. They're, this is a part where they just stop the podcast. Yeah, they're just they're, like, they're just screw this. Stranger Things. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's like a young actor in Stranger Things. Anyway, it's really good. All right. I'll, I'll check it, it out. That's, I do that's... need to shed some pounds after the holidays. Well, listen, yeah, maybe you should go see this. and then Snacking you won't too much eat watching ev- Yellowstone. <laughs> you won't want to eat ever again. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, it's that bad. <laughs> Uh, I you know what my uh, resolution is? I tried uh, the wire, and I'm like I like I like the show? watching things. Yeah, and I oh, never it's so and, good. and I stopped after one or two, and I and everyone's like, oh, you got to get through yeah, the first yeah, yeah. few, and then you'll never forget. And I was like, oh gosh, it is so anyway. good. You yeah. have to see. You have to see the whole thing. That's kind of my listen. This is my New Year's resolution for 2023 to watch the whole wire without subtitles. Oh, why? Is it hard? <laughs> I don't know. I had to watch it with subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there it is. Okay, it's been a long one, so we'll take off. Uh, take off, eh? Yeah. A. Uh, take off, eh? Take off, eh? Happy, happy New Year, eh? <laughs> yeah, eh? I, I actually saw like people talking about the greatest uh, Christmas songs of all time, and Bob and hey. Doug were not in there. I was quite surprised. <laughs> so what the heck? Yeah. Are you kidding? I was w- waiting for it to be like top three. Yeah. The the what is it the I'm the twenty beers of Christmas is that what it's called? Oh, I don't even remember how many. You don't even know what it's called. <laughs> no, I think it's the twenty <laughs> beers of Christmas. Bob and Doug. All right, let's just cut it. Anyway, uh, you know that uh, Getty Lee's in it. Oh yeah, you, know, you remember? Yeah, that? yeah. No, I know. I totally know the song. Oh no, the twelve days of Christmas performed by Bob and Doug. Yeah. You know what we'll do? Lena, put we'll it in the show notes. The link to the 12 Days of Christmas. Forget it. No, just actually play it right at the end of the podcast here. You guys are making too many demands after this long recording No, can we do that, Lena? Can you you include it? Um, I don't know. Oh, I don't know if I can. Okay, the link. I'm in. Oh, the link. I'll send you you the I'll send you the video and you can add it. Okay. I'll send you the audio. Okay. There it is, folks. All right. It's there. Take care, everybody. (laughs) All right. Thanks. Have a good, happy new year, everyone. Okay, good day. It's our Christmas part of the album, and you can play this at your Christmas parties uh, or to yourself on Christmas Eve if there's nothing else to do. Good day, eh? Yeah. In case you thought, like, I wasn't on this part. Oh, I guarantee you, you'd be on. Okay, so good day. This is the Christmas part, and we're going to tell you what to get uh, your true love for Christmas. <laughs> Look out the window. Where? What are you doing? Snow. What? Oh, head. it's a great white north. And it's snowing because it's Christmas time. Hey, Hoser, what? Uh, here's a quiz. Quiz for Doug. Okay, I have my thinking toque on. Yeah, right. What are the 12 days of Christmas? Just um, figure it out, right? Christmas is when? Uh, the 25th. Right, and what's the 24th? Christmas Eve, right? So that's, that's two. two. And then what's after that? Uh, Boxing uh, wrestling day. day. No, Get Boxing out. Day, yeah, yeah. That's three. I know. Then what's after that? Nothing. New Year's. Four. And what's New Year's Eve? Five. Okay. Where do you get 12? Uh, there's two Saturdays and Sundays in there. That's four. That's nine. And three other days, which I believe are the mystery days. Oh. Okay, now, this is our Christmas song. In case you don't know what to get somebody for Christmas. There's lots of ideas in here, so listen and don't get stuck. Okay. By the way, that's me on the organ. You start. Okay. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a beer. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two turtlenecks and a beer. Okay. Good. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three French toast, two turtlenecks and a beer. Okay. That should be more there, right? Eh? Where? On the so, fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Four pounds of back bacon, three French toast, two turtlenecks, and a beer in a tree. Oh, you need yeah. more. The fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me five golden toques. 
four pounds of back bacon, three French toast, two turtlenecks, and a beer in a tree. Okay, on the six, to go. Christmas, my true love gave to me six packs of two four five golden toots, four pounds of back bacon, three French toast, two turtlenecks, and a beer in a tree. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me seven packs of smoke and chip. Oh, six packs of two five, five golden toots, four pounds of back bacon, three French toast, two turtlenecks, and a beer in a tree. I keep forgetting. This should just be the two days of Christmas. It's too hard for us. Um, go home. Oh, the eighth, eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Eight comic books, seven packs of smoke, six packs of two for five. And a beer on the Yeah, that beer is empty. Okay, day uh, 12. Good day, and welcome to day 12. Yeah. Golden tooth. Four pounds of bag bacon, three French toast, two turtleneck, and a beer in a dream. Where did you learn to do that? Uh, albums? Oh, so, like, that's our song. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, and good day. Good day, everybody. Happy. But I Merry Christmas, everybody. Or on the 12th day, you could have got me a dozen donuts. Go on to the you stores could have gone down and get some to, presents. Like the good donut shop where if you buy a dozen, you get another one free. And that would have been 13 for the 13 days of Christmas. Next Christmas, get me a chainsaw. Hey. Boy, that song is a beauty. Move. Yeah, I think it ranks up there with... Stairway to heaven. What?